Okay, we have with us uh, Mr. Steve Cochran, who is going to talk about the estimate and rationale uh, with Mr. Greg Luzanic. Gentlemen. Gonna need, you're going to need the microphone. Uh, 615, I've got to be out the door. But uh, with me tonight is Mr. Cochran. He's our our head track and field coach, our head winter track coach. And he has a need uh, that he'd like to bring to the board's attention uh, with our track and field equipment. Mr. Cochran. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as uh, Mr. Lezenik said, I'm the, the head track coach uh, and also the uh, head indoor track coach. Um, we have a, a presentation or a need tonight uh, to talk about uh, some equipment that uh, is unfortunately something that we have to buy every so many years just because of wear and tear. Um, you should have had a, a, a link on the agenda to the quote. Uh, there's a quote on there for a high jump pit uh, and the auxiliary equipment needed for that weather cover and so on, as well as a pole vault pit. Uh, and again, weather cover, there's a safety uh, pad that goes around the plant box area where they plant the pole. Uh, and then there are standard protection pads, base protection pads, I believe is what they're called on the uh, the quote, which protect that solid area where we have the standards, where they put the crossbar uh, and so on. And again, um, those are items that over time, you know, they are they are just made out of foam, basically. Um, and as especially with the uh, the pole vault pit, as kids land on that time and time again over the course of the last 12 years, uh, you get nice indentations in the foam, and all of a sudden the integrity of the pit uh, is no longer what it was when you made the purchase originally. Um, so much so that, and I have some pictures that I can show you, it gets to the point where as it rains, water sits on that and then compounds the problem, um, and then starts to also, even though it has a weather cover, it soaks in, and again, the integrity of the, the foam in the pit um, certainly wears over time. So, you know, it is one of those things that uh, for the in the case of the pole vault pit, it's usually about a 12 year cycle. Uh, pole vault pit will last about 12 years. High jump pit can last a little longer, um, unfortunately. And we've had our high jump pit, I think, for about it, it's somewhere between 12 and 15. It's a little older than our our pole vault pit. Uh, the high jump pit that we have right now is slightly undersized as far as a safety issue is concerned. I don't know how many of you are familiar with track and field at all and the, the setup for a high jump pit. Typically in a high jump pit, um, you have a little cutout where the standards kind of sit and then the pad extends underneath that crossbar to provide some extra safety. Um, you know, unfortunately, we made that purchase before. We don't have that. Um, we've just got a basically a rectangular setup, a rectangular base. And so even some of the, the coaches, some of the coaches from other schools have been a little bit fussy over the years because we haven't had that. Um, as a part of this proposal, I'm proposing that we get a high jump pit that's a little bit more up to code with um, what you see at, at all the other high schools, basically, that we go to. Um, you know, again, it, it's primarily with the pole vault pit. It's primarily the foam. Um, we have had a couple of storms and issues where we've come back from away meets and only to come back and find the pole vault pit all in a tangled mess because it's amazing that, I don't know if you've ever seen the size of the pole vault pit, but you get a strong enough wind gust, it can pick those things up. And uh, again, we've lost some clips and things like that. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and it's not an easy thing to untangle because there's a whole weather cover. And luckily, I've had help to do that when I've had that issue. But do you have any questions at all about any of those things? Um, I can I can find you. I asked when was it purchased the last time? I can find you the exact date. I have that email somewhere in my uh, list. I believe it was... I want to say 11 years ago and so we are right at the end of that cycle of, of usefulness typically that's typically actually the end of their warranties as well is that 10 to 12 year window and then you said you lose clips are yes there are clips that anchor it to the ground or? no no not to the anchor it to the ground there are different clips there are velcro straps that actually the pole vault pit is made up of probably this one has five different no i'm sorry seven different pieces to it that are velcroed together and then there are straps that that strap the back pieces together um, and then there's a common cover that has to cover the entire thing that's where some of the clips have come off of of those pieces um, 
so that top cover that has to be on top with the uniform cover um, is where some of the clips have been lost and with the weather cover. So there's no way to anchor it so that it doesn't fly away during your... No, there's there's no way to anchor storm. those things. Well, what, what would happen in that case if you anchored it, if a wind is strong enough to do that, any anchor you have would probably just then tear the yeah. material and so you'd end up with more damage that way. That's not where the primary damage has happened. It's just they only last so long. Yeah, I'm just. I'm oh yes, yeah. The other thing, Mr. McElhenney reminded me also in the uh, in the weather, the top covers over time also is that foam starts to disintegrate as kids land on that. The foam starts to then again pop up and get in kids' eyes and things like that. That we're at that point also in both pits. What's the weather covering made of? The weather cover is a vinyl material. So it just degrades from the ultraviolet. No, no, not the weather cover. But... There's there's two different covers. There's a top cover. That top cover is not the weather cover. That top pad is what goes on the top of the things to make it one piece. Yeah, basically it's got a mattress pad. Um, and then on top of that is the weather cover that just goes on. It doesn't stay on whenever kids are competing. That's just to protect it from weather as it sits out throughout the season. And are the weather covers for the pit and the, the high jump pit and the pole vault pit, are they totally degraded and worn out? And they're, good? Yes, they are at the point where, again, the, in the case of the high jump pit, we're talking about a different size. In the case of the pole vault pit, um, it's white. And if you see, it's actually got black, uh, some mold, I would say, on it as well. And, and the clips also because of, as that flew off, um, some of those clips no longer attach. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there's, uh, well, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's like I said, these things have a life cycle um, for a pole vault pit. It's about 10 to 12 years, and that's where we are. Uh, the high jump pit lasts longer because you're not landing on it as, you know, from as high a distance. Um, but it is, again, undersized, and it's it's been probably the better part of 15 years since we've gotten one of those. When you say a pit, it's really a foam pad. Yes. Ground, yes. Um, and the summertime, these are stored? The summertime, we have utilized, we've done some summer activities with pole vault. We have summer pole vaulting that we do. Um, and then it will make its way to the shed as we get here towards the end of the fall. Um, the high jump pit was put away. It, it gets put away usually at the end of the season. No one, no one comes for high jump summer practices. Oh, well, you know, there's something exciting about pole vault. That <laughs> Mrs. Bro, just to answer your question, and I could be wrong on this, Mr. Cochran, but mm -hmm. I do believe I remember replacing this in 2013. The high jump pit, we uh, may maybe have replaced it's as I early think. as then. So, okay, it may be younger than that. I remember that Pat got it. I didn't remember the order of which were which. Um, again, the the primary concern with the high jump pit is just the undersized and not having that cut out. I think Pat found himself a, a, a bargain deal and didn't realize <laughs> that uh, what we were getting at the time really wasn't uh, up to, to standard. It, it certainly seems to me like we could do something to secure it from the wind, um, some kind of strapping that would not hurt it, but keep it from being all tangled up. That seems, that seems kind of... It's, it's a rare occurrence. Um, and like I said, the, the, the danger in doing too much of that is um you know right now a clip or two maybe kind of gets broken we can deal with a clip or two here or there um if we anchor that to the ground and attach that fabric to the ground um i i just envisioned the whole side of the the pit being ripped off and then we've got to replace the whole thing uh immediately like i said a clip here or there we can work around that as long as it's not in a, a, a key location um but ripping the entire side off the pit would be, that would be kind of rough. 36,394. That's for both of them. That's for both combined. Is there a warranty on these? There is a warranty. And what is it? <laughs> I, the warranty is, is for basically the it's a limited warranty. Sure. It, it's for basic defects in terms of, you know, primarily manufacturing type issues that we had. Okay. And how long? 
Um, I do not know the definite answer for that. I believe that uh, it is in the ballpark of that 10 year period. But again, it's, it's a pretty limited warranty. Um, a lot of the things that we talk about are normal wear and tear kinds of issues. This would be more like if the seams ripped in the, in the pit and all of a sudden, um, you know, in two years, we've got just through normal use, big rips in the seams. Those are the types of things that they would, would have under warranty. Any other questions? Right. How, when would they be able to start? This is this is just an equipment purchase. This is an equipment. We have we have a sixty day quote right now, which is about halfway in. Um, I got this quote from UCS at the beginning of September or towards the beginning of September. Uh, it's a sixty day quote, and it is just a matter of it, 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 this is stuff that they sell all the time. So it, you know, it, it it will be in and it will be ready to go, and and for spring that's not an issue. Um, so yeah, this this isn't anything that they have to come and do. This this comes on a truck and it's all vacuum sealed, and I've got to unseal it so that the foam doesn't uh, set like that, and it's it's up and running. No, 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 no. There's no digging or anything. This is just this is just replacing equipment that we cannot typically afford in our normal two thousand dollar a year track budget. But nonetheless, it's it's things that that have to be replaced every decade or so. <laughs> okay yeah the and again um you know he's gonna say this but of course with with everything else uh in the the market that we're in right now in terms of shipping and things like that um this is one of those things that you know while we we certainly can can get another quote from him a couple of months down the road uh chances are much better that uh price is going to go up as opposed to go down with shipping uh, the way that it is across the country. Is this available through the state program? We would have to take a look. I mean, we can't just accept this quote, Mr. Cochran. We'd have to, I, and I would work with you. Right. We would need to get at least three quotes for a purchase this large just to meet the state requirements for purchasing. Unless we could find this stuff on some type of state contract um, that Pennsylvania approves. And it may be on there. I, I just don't see where it. But even even that, getting three quotes and and the state contract, check the state contract. I'm not convinced the state contract is always the lowest price. No, no, we can we can get as many as yeah. we. This need. this will be one of those things that um you know you have a limited number of people that that sell pole vault pits. Um, by far this is the superior product. Instead, uh, you know, the, most of the rest of the stuff that's out there, um, is not the same. For instance, the the um. That's the word I want to look for. The height of the pit itself, um, I believe it's listed on there. Is it 32 inches? Is that what the height list it is? 32 inches. For the yeah, there are many, many other ones out there that you'll be able to get at a cheaper price, but they're 28 inches. And so we're sacrificing a little bit of safety and some things like that. The high jump pit is 28 inches. The high jump pit is, right. It's 28 inches, but it's also you're landing on that from six feet as opposed really to just a pad. It's 16. Not a pit. It's not a pit. well they call it a pit that's that's the name that's the name i don't make this stuff up um is, is this the same company you bought it from before this is the same company that we've bought every pole vault pit from that, that we've gotten now you know again there are other companies that sell ucs material but we've gone right to the manufacturer this is this is from the manufacturer this is not from some middle guy um if we order this through one of the other athletic companies that are out there um, MF Athletics or some of the other ones that are there, at best, they'd be able to match that, probably at worst, because they need to get their cut on top of things, too, since they're a middle group. Um, we're, we're looking at a higher cost. So, you know, I, I've gone to I've gone to the source, basically, in terms of, you know, we're going right to the company and ordering right from the company as opposed to somebody in the middle that's got to make their profit as well. Okay. But for us to take this to, to buildings and grounds and finance, we need this, we need multiple bids. Yes, um, we, we need yes. to confirm this is a reasonable number. Um, is there any other consumable items that track uses that um, of this magnitude? Uh, no. The, the, the only other thing that's even remotely close to that is if you have to replace um, a cage for the discus, uh, basically to kind of stop the disc from flying off into the, the crowd um that's also a pricey item however that is not one that needs to be replaced on a 
uh, nearly as frequent a basis as, as these pits. So if we're only getting eight or 10 years out of this, we need $4,000 a year in our yeah. in a replacement fund. Well, Jared, can you get it on the next audit findings committee? Mm -hmm. Put it on. And then I'd like to know, how many students participated last year? Average number of students for track and field. We have 80 to 100 kids in track and field at the high school. We have a matching number at the junior high school. Um, so, right, there's a certain number of students that use the pole vault area, use the high jump area. I would say annually we have. Uh, uh, with the junior high, 20 to 30 pole vaulters. We have probably high jumpers. We have junior high, high jumpers. So many high jumpers. You, everybody wants to be a high jumper in junior yeah. high. So it's, well, no, we, I would say we have 20 to 30 kids in the junior high. And between the junior high and high school, we're talking at least an equal number that, that utilize that at the. Okay. Yeah, I can put some of that information together for our meeting in October. And do any other schools ever use this? Do we have any situations where a school doesn't have a high jump or a pole vault pit and the, they, the, they uh, try to use ours? Do we ever lend it out? Not lend no, it. we do, do not. Do no. anybody use it on our property? Not without me there. So, no, we have had, uh, and, it, and it's not because of a, a lack of equipment other than, the uh, rather, other than the case of IUP and their meet that they held where we had an agreement with them that they came over. Uh, and I don't know, Jared, did they pay us ever yet for <laughs> that use or not? They, they were supposed to give us I believe they did. Yeah, we, they did. We, we okay. Did build them. Okay. Yep. Is this used in the classes? It is not. It is not. Seems like a big opportunity missing here. Uh, pole vault would be a huge <laughs> liability in a <laughs> in a gym class. <laughs> Maybe not high jump. So, would you like me to get quotes for the exact same? Um, work with Jared. Um, yeah. We're going to have to get. Uh, multiple numbers on a price at this stage. This was $3,000 Right, 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 right. Okay. So work with Jared, get the numbers, bring it to uh, um, Julia's committee, and let's uh, get this into a vote. Okay. Okay. Anything else from the committee? Anybody else want to say anything? Okay. Rob, we can move ahead. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to talk about lacrosse. Uh, no cross request. Jared has a cost proposal projection that he's going to share with you. Oh. I took it back. Yeah, it is connected or, or linked to the agenda here tonight. Um, I believe um, Lacrosse was at the last academic committee meeting to uh, discuss the possibility of being for additional funding through the school board or complete funding through the school board um, for the upcoming season. Uh, those those conversations led to the request to have additional information brought back to the committee for cost. Um, and that is what, if Randy could pull that up, um, is attached to the agenda. And while he does that, um, I do want to thank Mrs. Lockhart and Mrs. Woods for helping me put that together. We worked, you know, I worked together with the lacrosse club to make sure we had as accurate information as possible. Um, because from the district perspective, we don't know everything that they do. So we worked hand in hand to help put this together. And again, it was shared with, with the board already. Um, but just to really summarize it um, here tonight, we are estimating that the yearly cost for both a, a individually for a boys team and a girls team is around $16,837 per team. Um, so that's almost a total of $33,000 or a little over $33,000 to run both teams. Uh, yep. But for boys and girls, which is pretty much equal, that includes a head coach, an assistant coach, and that is both the salary and the benefit information that goes along with that. 
And then other costs included in that are referees, transportation, um, helmet recertification, having an EMT or an athletic trainer at each of the home uh, matches. And then uh, the Hoodle uh, web hosting, that is just some an opportunity that we also, or a service that a lot of our other teams also take part in. Um, but that total comes to $22,337. So that's the total cost that we are estimating to run both teams. And then because if the school district would fund it as other teams to that level, we would then ask for pay to participate from the lacrosse players, which we estimate would bring in about $1,000 per team in revenue. And then we could also charge ticket sales at each of their home matches, which we estimate would bring in about $4,500 in a season. And that's where the yearly cost is about $16,837 per team. And that would be the recurring yearly cost um, for each of those teams. Now, there was some other items um, that we discussed as things that or just needed equipment wise, similar to what we're talking about tonight for track, that would be periodic costs, not necessarily yearly costs, but things that as they wear out would need replaced. Some of these items could be needed for the first season um, that the, if the district does, does choose to fund it may need it to be bought right away. But those items um, totaled and you can see them on here, they're including helmets, uniforms, nets, uh, lacrosse balls, um, goalie gear, for the um, both teams, um, for boys, that total was about fourteen thousand five hundred and twenty-five dollars, and then for the girls' team, it was about seven thousand five hundred and fifteen. And that the big difference between those is really the helmets, where the boys' teams are required for helmets, and the girls' team does not have the requirement for helmets. But that again would be something that is a non-recurring cost, periodic cost. That could go along with um, paying for those two teams. Jared, um, thirty-three thousand for both teams. Is that a net figure, or do you take, or do you subtract from that the one thousand in the pay-to-play and the forty-five hundred in the tickets? The thirty-three is the net figure. Okay, so that's already figured in ticket sales and the pay-to-play. Yes. Thank you. The items that are the non-recurring items, the ones the periodic costs. The, yeah, the periodic costs. They already have a lot of that material now. Some of that, that stuff. So <laughs> what would be what would be required to be purchased now? Uh, we, do they have all? Do, would they need all new helmets? All new. Uh, that would be something we would need to discuss with what the current lacrosse group is willing to. I want to say donate to the district as part of starting the team, or we would really need to negotiate with them on that. Do the helmets have to be recertified like the football helmets? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Goalie helmet too. Just the goalie helmets? Well, like we currently right now, um, Eric Davis wears house helmets, so we can't necessarily force parents to get these helmets recertified for Put their children and helmets that are safe. Okay, so, yes, if the, if the school would provide helmets, yes, they need to be certified. Anything that you provide has to be recertified. If, if the players purchase them on their own, it's their liability. The helmets have to be done every year. Like the football helmets? Yeah, like football helmets. What does it cost to be certified in football helmets? Uh, it's that total reconditioning is like. So part of the periodic cost or the annual cost would be um, recertifying 40, 40 some helmets at 25 bucks each. Um, and the consumables like the lacrosse ball should be up in that. Um, that's not a periodic cost either. That's going to be a yearly cost. Do we, do we provide sticks? Just the goalie sticks? The district wouldn't be responsible for providing sticks. Um, the equipment provided for the player would include for the boys um, uh, their mouth guard, their stick, their cross, their gloves, their shoulder pads, their arm pads, 
Uh, this year, our employees have to have um, heart guard certified um, chest protectors, which is going to be an additional cost uh, to those families. Uh, on the girls' side, the girls have to provide uh, their goggles, their mouth guard, and their lacrosse stick. And those would be things that I think as a club, we've kind of agreed that those would continue to be provided by uh, the parents and, and, and the players. It, it, it'd be useful to see that on this list. You know, that uh, it's under there, under the equipment that's provided by the player. So it oh, there it is. Okay, or, I'm it sorry. It does say helmet under the boys, but. Yeah, I kept looking down the sheet and nothing yeah, that's was there. Okay. That's, yeah, that's right under the. Currently, our players all provide their own helmets except for the goalies. We provide helmets for all the goalies and goalie sticks because um, oftentimes there is not a uh, designated goalie. Oftentimes, uh, we still have kids that are wanting to try or training new kids are coming in to train it because at our youth program, we're a countywide program at our youth program, so sometimes the goalie who has played through the youth is not an Indiana resident, and so we need to find a new goalie who is an Indiana resident. So we typically provide the equipment for the goalie that way. The kid tries it for a month and doesn't like it, the parents find out that cost. So if they have money in their capital, I would say no. I mean, all of our booster, we would still have a lacrosse booster who would possibly help support this team, but we've never done that with any other booster group. So our booster program is responsible for our future. So our booster program then could be free to operate like any other booster program. Football, soccer. Uh, wrestling. We still have a youth program to support. Where the financial burden has been on our, our boosters program or on our club is having to fully fund the high school program, which you know we talked about this last time, that has received two thousand dollars per team per year on the boys' side for the past ten years, <coughs> the girls' side for the past seven. So our boosters, you know, our club program, I think we have been and Mary is just We've done everything we could up until this point to try to make lacrosse viable, affordable for all of these families in our district who want to participate. But we're at the point now where every year do we want this to be a question of whether or not our club can, can fully fund and support this program when we're trying to still bring kids up from the youth level. We don't expect other booster programs to turn that money over to the district. And, and we've been willing to donate things like we've talked about donating our nets and things like that. You know, the things that we already, you know, use and provide so that our teams can play as a school sport. But to ask that the club then still be financially responsible or to turn over those funds. Remember, our funds come from registration because they have to register in order just to cover our minimum costs. They come from having to pay a $35 mandatory U.S. lacrosse fee that we have to pay because our insurance has to come through our club, which is not something that our players would then be required to pay if we were a fully funded school sport. So these are all things that you know our parents have been on the, on the hook for um, for a long time. And so you know, respectfully, I would ask that you know our club be allowed to to be the same type of boosters program that. That we have for the other school sports here in Indiana. This is this is an investment in these kids. That they're they're here because lacrosse means something to them. It's one of the most popular sports now in the country, the fastest growing one, and one of the most popular ones here in Indiana. And it's a testament to these kids and to these families, um, the support, the you know the time, the effort that they have put in to making sure that Indiana school district as a high school lacrosse program. Um, and, and so again, I thought that's kind of why we're here. Um, it's just to, to ask that the district you know, meet us at, at that point and say that we're worth the investment, that these kids are worth that investment from the district. It will have an immediate effect on these families. It will have a long-term effect. I and mean, think about why people come into this district. Of course, it's our academic programs, but we also know that the reality is, is it's the athletic programs. So it's not just the intangibles 
kids are getting, but it's of the tangible results that this district can recoup as a result of funding this program. And I think it's just something that I hope you really keep in mind. The price tag is one thing, you know, and I get that. I mean, we just had that presentation about track and field. I, I get the realities. I'm a track coach. I, I get the realities of the cost. But personally, I think we're a bargain for, for what you're getting in return, both from the intangibles. These are quality kids who have put in a lot of time into this sport and uh, the tangibles of, of what we can get as a district by luring families in with, you know, the possibility of having lacrosse would be the only one in the district or in the, in the county that has it. And you're just asking for varsity. You're not talking about these numbers to include junior varsity. No, we, no, there, there is no, right at this point, at least in our area, there's no scholastic, um, you know, league or anything like that for junior high. Yeah, no, that's no, varsity and JV. JV. Oh, JV, I'm oh, sorry. I didn't understand that. No, that's no, our entire high school program. No junior high. No junior high. No junior high. No junior high. It'd be, it'd be, like baseball. And last year during the pandemic, we still had over 70 kids across the two high school teams. Great. Um, and also make it uh, into the second or third round of, of playoffs. We the girls made it to semifinals and the boys made it to quarterfinals. Yeah, I read about you in the paper. Yeah, it's exciting. Jerry, the. Um Sorry for the coaches. Is that how did, how did that get established at sixty one hundred? Um, we tried to make it comparable to the other coaches, uh, other coaches within the the contract that would have similar seasons. So like a few less games than a softball coach. Yeah, we tried to look at length of season, number of games, those type of things to make it as similar as possible. No, and you did the same with the assistant coach. Yes, sir. You mentioned um, insurance. Um, I don't see insurance on these costs here. There would no longer be an issue if it were fully funded by the school. We wouldn't have to have the U.S. lacrosse memberships anymore. And I, and I will reach out to our insurance company to see if by adding lacrosse as a team, if it would change our insurance okay. rates at all. We've added lacrosse as a team. I'm a little puzzled with why they're buying separate insurance. They're a varsity team. So why? why they're a varsity team. Our coaches would not be covered by the, the school district's insurance policy. The coaches have to be Are, covered by U.S. Cross. No, I understand what you're saying. I just don't understand from my perspective why you would be, why why where your money came from would make a difference. Okay. We don't get athletic trainers from the school. We don't. So I understand all yeah. that. Okay. I don't understand why if you're if you're giving your kids a varsity letter at the end of the year, why you're not under our insurance. Okay, and also don't understand why they're not under our athletic trainer. Okay, now that's not, some of that is because it's not in the contract, but that's something that we need to work on. Okay. Does well, that, that I think make we sense? have to figure out a way to be equitable. I mean, it's obviously a popular sport, and the coaches, you know, you all have done a heck of a job. It's obvious across the community. But um, we have to be come up with a formula that's fair because there's only so many dollars for it. There's a lot of a lot of people that are interested in hockey is another one, so we have to. But you do understand that when you compare us to hockey, that that's kind of apples and oranges. I do. Okay. Yeah. But that is not considered to be a, a school sport in the same way that we are. Yes. You're actually playing a whippy old schedule. Right. We're through the PIAA and playing a whippy old schedule. Whereas hockey is a PIAA something or other. Right. Hockey is considered a club sport. Yeah. We are actually a school sport. We are a non-funded yeah. school sport. Which, why, that's why I was yes. questioning why yeah. you're not under our insurance. Okay. So, I there you go. Working. More things to do. <laughs> um, I'm looking at this and you're really needing, you're needing 50 some thousand dollars to pull this off. So, is that? Can I say this? Sorry. No, 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 don't, don't apologize. That's what yeah, you're looking for. Yeah, I just only, I could only sit for so long. Thank you. Everybody that does me know I have to say something eventually. Um, so I'm one of the coaches. I'm, I'm the assistant head coach. Mike is the head coach for the girls program. And, you know, this is a question of if not now, why? You know, and, and the reason being is uh, as far as affordability, this sport is one of the most affordable sports out there. As far as kids wanting to play, 
this is one of the most attractive sports there is for our kids to play. This is now an Olympic sport. This is now a national sport. This is a sport that is growing by leaps and bounds in comparison to that of football, lacrosse, or excuse me, soccer, track. We have seen and watched, and I know this for a fact because I, I was a cross country coach. I was a track coach for Indiana. And we have watched the numbers diminish over the years in, in all of those sports. And in popularity, we see things grow. And this is one of those sports that we see that happen. Uh, as we travel through Western Pennsylvania, we, we talk to constantly, we have college coaches contacting both Coach Mike and myself, asking about our kids going on to play. And that's where we talk about the intangible, the money in the hand. It's not necessarily that you're getting it into the school district, but you're seeing your kids being able to go on and play collegiately uh, a college sport that is in, in its infancy. And if we grow this program right here from a grassroots level, we give these kids an opportunity to be ahead of the college program. Instead of joining a football program or a, a soccer program or even a track program that's been around for years, we are are new to this sport. That is a true fact. This entire country is even newer than Indiana is. So I say give us an opportunity. Give these kids an opportunity. They deserve it. They work hard. They need the opportunity to be able to play at a high school level and do the things that our team did last year and the boys team did last year. With that, we will see this program continue to grow. And I you know, I just ask every board member here, please take a minute to consider what it takes to make this program grow versus any other program that you fund. Please. Thank you. Anyone else in the yeah. 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 Is, there, are they, is this getting over the internet? Um, we have a microphone there. So. You didn't have to use one. I know, I was trying to figure it out. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, my name's Mike Weaver. Uh, Coach Al and I have been coaching for probably seven or eight years uh, together uh, at its infancy, um, pretty much. Uh, my biggest, uh, I mean, I'm very impressed with how long we've been able to sustain lacrosse over the last 10 years or so by just, you know, fundraising and, um, but one of the, the things that is is a huge upsetting factor to me is is that we turn away so many kids. And I'm sure it's, that's like on the boys level, because I'm sure you guys, you know, have turned around a, a lot of way kids once you drop the financial burden on it. Because there's unfortunately there are people in our district that can't afford to play lacrosse. Um, I know Coach Al and I, we've had a number of girls that stopped at practice and, you know, I tell them straight out, I'd love to have you, but you know, I'm sorry, I'm, but you know, it costs pretty, you know, a lot of money. What are we looking at, like 450 or, you know, plus if you're just starting out, you know, add another 150 uh, to 200 dollars on there for equipment, you know, and some people just can't afford that. So we turn so many student athletes away every year that are interested in this, you know, upcoming sport just because of financial burdens. You know, and, and we tried in the past, and I don't know if we still do it. We used to give scholarships out, but I don't think we do that because we can't afford it. So for a number of years, I think each team, boys and girls, we are allowed to sustain uh, three scholarships for um, kids that were underprivileged and can't, couldn't afford to play. But because, you know, of, you know, financial burdens with us fundraising, we know we had to let that go. Um, and that's, to me, that's one of the most unfortunate things is that there's so many great student athletes out there, just kids in general, that would love to play the sport, but they simply can't just because they can't afford it because of the financial restraints. Um, so that, to me, is one of the huge factors in, you know, making this a, a, a school-funded sport where we wouldn't have to turn away any kids anymore. It'd be open to everybody, you know, you know regardless on – you know, what their, their financial status is uh, at home. Thank you. There you go. 
Um, my name is Beth Kobach. I'm the current president of the Lacrosse Association. Um, I wanted to add, I'm a couple of things. One, I'm involved on the uh, Western Pennsylvania area level for the youth boys. I'm on the board for that. We probably last year we added, I believe, four clubs at that level. Um, it's just growing in the area, not just at the high school level, but also at the youth level. It is growing faster than people can fund for it. Um, I just see a big boom coming in in the in the area of people who want to play this. And as Mike said, I think cost is a big factor. And I think if we can make it more affordable, I think we're going to see it here. Um, when I first came on, we were in financial trouble. Um, we tried to be a little more competitive with other schools as far as, you know, how we ran our program, um, being able to pay our coaches, um, the facilities we offered. Uh, unfortunately, some of the other schools charge a lot more than we do, uh, and it put us into a hole. So basically, uh, I became enemy number one for our program. And with the coaches, when I just started telling them no for everything, and I'm sure they all complained about me an awful lot, but um, for the last two years, we have really slashed what we give our kids and what we give our coaches um, to try to help the program financially recover. Um, one of our big things that we did last year was, um, you can see the t-shirt I'm wearing, we basically turned every player into walking billboard and we went around to all the different businesses in the area and begged for money and put their name on the back of the program. We had signs made at the fields during games they hung. Um, and we were very thankful for the community support that we received from businesses that put us in a better place financially where we are a little bit, um, we have a little more of a cushion and we can provide preseason practices for the kids and make things a little more competitive again for them. But that being said, with um, the way the economy is, it's not something that we can rely on every year for the business support that we had. Uh, and as the cost of facilities and other things go up, I'm not sure what we'll be able to uh, provide for the, the players. So that's where we are asking for your help. Anyone else? I'm a senior for the. Uh... I'm a senior for the uh, Indiana lacrosse team, and um, throughout throughout my years playing lacrosse, I've seen a lot of people come up and uh, like are very interested about playing lacrosse, and they're very passionate about it. But they've they've they couldn't play because they couldn't afford like a stick or a helmet or shoulder pads or any of the necessary equipment that you have to have to play. And I think that's really really sad to see. And, but despite all the all the people we've had to turn away and all the potential we've had to turn away just because of the financial burden, I think like we were, we were the, one of the most successful programs last year um, for high school sports. Like we were up there, like the girls' team was very successful. We were very successful. Um, like we were up there, right up there with like with like all all of our good programs that have the funding and don't have to turn people away. So I would just like to say, like imagine what we'd be able to do if we. If we had funding, we didn't have to turn potential players away. Anyone else? Let me ask Greg a question. Um, he has to take off. Um, I'd like to know what the negative impact on the other sports in that season would be. Well, in the spring season, Mr. Harley, we have uh, in the boys' side baseball, track and field, and lacrosse. Uh, we have uh, girls on a girls' side, track and field, softball, and lacrosse. Uh, you know, there are student athletes like many of these that that lacrosse is maybe their only sport. Uh, so. I'm not going to uh, stand here and say that all 70 kids, if not playing lacrosse, would play another sport. Uh, but then I also couldn't stand here and say that there isn't a negative impact uh, just because of the total number of the sports that we have. 
you know, we're, we are not a huge district numbers wise with the schools we compete against and our, some of our sports, you know, in the winter, same thing. Uh, we're spread a little thin, you know, in the fall, we're spread a little thin, but I, I think that each sport has their own niche and in their own place in within the athletic program and that you know uh again if there was would you say 70 or no about 40 kids on the two teams combined 50 something like that i mean i'm not going to say that you know that that 100 percent of them uh would play another sport you know track and field might lose a, a a few and so would baseball and softball but in the big picture uh I think all of our sports would be sustainable. Um, but, you know, Indiana has 30 sports, counting dance team and cheerleading. That's a lot. We ha- we do have a lot of sports and a lot of opportunities. Okay. What about the crowd? Win one. Thanks. Um, I'm a junior this year, and I've been playing for about four years. And um, I just kind of wanted to add on to what um, they said earlier. The I've seen my other teammates put in hours of work. Um, I know some of us work year round because this is the only sport we play. So they put in a lot of dedication. I know girls that um, and probably on the boys side, too. I know a lot of the girls go play true lacrosse during the summer to get better with their skills and also work with other players from the region. And I think that funding the program would be a huge help because then we would give more kids that opportunity to be part of our family and it really is like a family I think um I think a lot of the other players here would agree with me that when you're on the field with your teammates you work together really well you practice together year round I know pretty soon we'll probably start preseason practice and so um, I think for a lot of us, this is a very important thing. And I think it would make bigger opportunities for other students who I know many of my friends wish they could play, but they're not able to financially. And last year on the sidelines, we had enough for both a varsity and JV team, which was huge. But this year we only have, we may not have enough for both teams. And I know so many other people that would love to play but can't because of their financial situation. And we could have tons more players that would get this amazing opportunity to be part of this family. And I think all the hard work that we put in really pays off. Um, Like I said, everyone works very hard and we all really enjoy the sport. So your support and giving us this funding would be huge for all of us. Thank you. I'll be super quick. I know it's already almost six thirty. Just given my perspective, coming from the eastern side of the state, growing up in Philadelphia, like in my my high school, like lacrosse was like part of the you know school districts that we play. I was in Delaware County, you know Delco, and I went to Marple Newtown. And like I said, all the high schools in my area, lacrosse was part of the uh, of um, a PIAA. So it's just exciting to see that it's coming. You know, I'm not sure. Maybe it's been in the western side for years as well. But it's 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 just exciting to hear that it's starting to come in, in the middle, you know, middle west, middle east side of the state. So it's just exciting to hear that. And I just want to again just give my quick perspective growing up outside of Philadelphia, where it was part of my high school. And I just thought that was you know a status quo across the state. But it's it's nice to learn that it's getting the excitement building up in this area. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Addie Lockard. I'm both of the coach's daughter. <laughs> so. I'm around lacrosse all of the time. I have been playing for, this will be my eighth year now. I have been very fortunate in order to play for some of the travel teams and play in Pittsburgh and get to see girls around. And everyone that I've talked to, especially since we started it this summer and we started talking about this, I was talking to some of those girls and they just, they couldn't believe that we were still not fully funded by the school and everyone that I've talked to had said about how their schools had been fully funded and I would go and I would look at those teams and like we were saying about turning away some of those girls you would see they would have 40 50 girls on their teams and sometimes 
they wouldn't be able to take everybody because of how big their teams were. And I know Indiana is very big on academics and even we've had some of our seniors this year go and be able to play collegiately because of how far our lacrosse teams have gotten and how well our teams have worked together. And I think that would really help, especially some of the people that have had the financial difficulties be able to go and get these great scholarships and be able to do something that they really, truly love, go and continue that collegiately, whether it's D1, D3, anywhere. It, I think it would really help. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Strauss. Yeah, Tom. Um, I do understand the legal difference between lacrosse and hockey. The question that I would like to raise, though, is that as long as I've been on the board, we've been approached a number of times by the hockey teams, by the coaches, by the students, to increase their funding as well. My concern is that I believe that you're absolutely passionate about this sport and that it does do a lot of good both for the parents' point of view as well as from the student's point of view. But I think those same values, regardless of the legal definition, are also present in the hockey team. The, the, those, those hockey players are just as passionate. They believe in their sport. They believe in the value that it brings to them personally and to the community. And financing is also a major in, a barrier of entry for a number of those students. And so my concern is that, and it's not that I'm opposed to this, but rather if we do it for lacrosse, then we certainly have to take a serious look at doing it for the hockey team as well. If we're talking about equity for our students, then we need to look at all of our students and it's not just about the legal definition of what a club sport or a, a team sport is. The hockey team still wears Indiana on their jerseys. So that's the concern that I have. It's not just about funding lacrosse, but can we fund the hockey as well to a similar, similar level? I think whatever we do, or at least this is my feeling on it, we should do more or less equally across the board to the best of our abilities. I, I take a, a slight issue with that in that when these people first came a hundred years ago and you had, you cobbled together a team of girls, a team of boys, and you started playing, the charge was to get a viable program of boys and girls. The hockey hasn't done that. The hockey doesn't have a viable girls team. Am I wrong on that? There are no girls to play hockey. Well, and there's no girls' team. Correct. Whereas lacrosse has managed to do, has managed through hard work to get both the girls and a boys' team and a viable feeding program. So that's 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 the big difference between the two the, the, the two sports that I see. That that they also are serving. They're also serving the females. And that's something we need. We need to increase our um, increase our uh, contact. So that's the big difference between the two sports. So um, I'd like to make that point. Um, I don't think there's anybody on the board that wouldn't like to fund you if we didn't have to raise taxes. And the problem is, is how do we fund you and buy books and put the roofs on the buildings? And you're not asking for. Um, a little bit of money. It's, it's fifty some thousand and thirty thousand on an annual basis, and and that's going to take a deep, a deep swallow for the board to approve. And then you have the and then you have the problem with the hockey team, which is only a two thousand dollar bill right now. I, I can I can assure you that if we approve this, carte blanche with the lacrosse team, next month we'll have the hockey team sitting in those same seats making making that same request okay and 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 so that's the and, and i recognize that the difference again with the 
with the the girls team, but at, at, and 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 the lacrosse where the they they haven't done that in the hockey team, but I I just think that that's where we're going to have a, a an issue is that they're going to be there asking for the same thing and how do we say no then? But we but but you use the word carte blanche, so they've asked for a number of numbers, not a lot of stuff. So we may not be able to deliver 100% in the time immediately, nor for the hockey team, but we may be able to do something phased in. And we may be able to even come to some sort of fundraising agreement with these teams so that they can be brought in. I mean, we're going to have to be creative because there's no question that um, this lacrosse team has come a long way. These teams have come a long way. So it's hockey. I mean, they were magnificent last year. I mean, I couldn't get over it. I, so, so, so I'm not, it's not, but, but we can do it. It's just that everybody needs things immediately. So that's where I think the, the glitch the, is, Walter. Julie, I, I agree with you that, and, and that's, I guess, kind of the point that maybe I didn't make succinctly enough. I think if we do something for the lacrosse team, which we probably should, then we need to do something of a similar manner um, uh, with the hockey team. Perhaps over a three or four year period. I just make a point. I, you know, I, I understand. I work for the district, uh, you know, I've been a teacher in the district for, for more than 20 years and in education for, for almost 30. I do understand the, the economic realities of this, but I also understand the flip side of that economic reality. Like you said about, the, you know, you talked about the intangibles and the tangibles, that when, when prospective buyers are looking for where do I want to send my kids to school, where do I want to live, you know, yes, they're going to look at Indiana and our academics that have, have, have long been, you know, one of our selling points. But I would also argue that that funding that you're talking about can easily be recouped, recouped by bringing and drawing people into the district. And I also point to the financial position that, that you know, that, that we are in. Uh, I, I do understand. Um, but at the same time, we just recently, you know, refinanced uh, a bond, you know, issue. We have recorded a $2 million surplus. And, and so I would ask respectfully, if not now, when? You know, there's never going to be a time in anyone's budget where they wake up and say, I have too much money, where am I going to spend this? But at the same time, you know, as far as where are we going to spend this? You know, if you put it into perspective and looking at, you know, I was looking at the proposal for what it would cost to buy those, um, those mats, you realize that the shipping cost of $2,200 is more than what the lacrosse program got last year. Like the girls program got 2,000, the boys program got 2,000. Okay. The shipping cost is $2,200 for those mats. So, so while I do appreciate what we're asking for and the amount of money that that is, I still go back to the idea that this board is, is, is here to invest and, and, and to support these students. And, and I think that investment is absolutely worth it. And that if there is a will, then there absolutely can be a way in this case. And I do respect, you know, like you said about hockey coming in, and, and if they do that, then, then then more power to them. But but I, I still also do see that distinction, both legally and then also in the opportunities that it's providing uh, to all of our students, not just our male students. So I know girls can play on our hockey team, we do not have a dedicated girls hockey team. And I'm a female coach who have always, you know, one of my passions is, is bringing girls into, into sports so that they can see all of the things that sports can do for them. So again, I, I ask you to, you know, I know I'm not the money person, I'm the passion person, but I ask you to really see that. <laughs> May I just say that thank you for bringing up our uh, projected surplus. <laughs> we are very proud of it. And I want everybody in this room and everybody in this board knows we have worked very hard to get there. And it's nice now to have a few options. But, and I hear you, but we have to be very, but it doesn't grow on trees and it's not easy to get there and to do it every year. So, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So I think that we are going to be as equitable as we can. But I don't think you should get your hopes up that you're going to necessarily get everything you've asked for, any of the teams, right away. I think we're going to figure something out, though. I'd like to say that publicly, that I think we can do a better job with the athletic budget and figure out how we might frame it so that we can give, give some help. So, but thank you for advertising our surplus, because I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's very nice to have. 
And we get that. I mean, like I said, we've worked really hard to get to where we're at, and it's better than we've been in a while. But it, you know, and we are also trying to be very careful. But I also just very quickly want to address the hockey issue, um, and I don't want that because I don't want to be crucified. I'm also on the hockey board. Um, <laughs> my son plays. Nope. <laughs> um, he is in tenth grade, um, and I feel like you know there's a couple different things with that point. First of all. You say legality, but that's a big issue. We are currently the only non-funded school sport. And, you know, yes, I understand that hockey wears Indiana, but so does ski club and so does um, music club and chess club and fingernail painting club and every other club that the school has right now, but we're not gonna go around and entertain buying everyone's fingernail polish and whatever else for that. I think, I also think hockey is an expensive sport and everyone who goes into that understands that. My son plays on two teams right now um, and you know going into it that you're gonna be doing fundraising and whatever else because everyone knows that that's probably one, other than the fact that my daughter rides horses, hockey is probably one of the most expensive sports out there. Um, on top of that, um, I lost my train. Oh. And we play at the school. We play use school facilities. We're already, you know, that kind of stuff is already going to be something that is taken care of. The hockey plays at the hockey rink. So you're looking at $280 an hour at ice. I'm currently the treasurer, so I know their costs. Um, $280 for ice for practice times. Um, our current Budget right now is probably close to thirty thousand dollars just to be for three of our four teams to be part of Hill. The budgets are not comparable whatsoever. So while I mean I know everyone would like to fund everybody, it's they're two completely uncomparable, incomparable things. Um, if you're looking at just school sports, I think the student ratio of who participates in our school sport compared to the funding that other school sports get and the student participation in those, let's say football, is huge. Um, we probably have just as many kids and receive their funding. So, I mean, I think if we're going to be comparable, you know, instead of comparing us to hockey, which is a club, I think comparing us to other school sports and what, you know, they currently get is a more reliable, for lack of a better word, comparison, uh, even comparison. The, my, my point, I understand the legal and, and the importance of the legality. I'm a small businessman. I deal with those issues every day. My main point was the, the, the value and the importance of the sport of hockey to the students that are playing it and to their parents is equal in my opinion, to lacrosse, football, track, wrestling, it doesn't matter. Those parents and those students invest themselves to the nth degree in those sports. There is no formal agreement. No, he didn't have something in writing. No, no, no. When no. you made them a school, when you didn't have an agreement. When they first came to the right. board, they were they didn't know if they could get twelve players together. Right. So you know it was it was a complete shot in the dark, and they and they built a program, but also. Uh, in agreement with you in at 450, there's a whole lot of people not playing. Um, and uh, I was a volunteer coach in softball, and I, I had to buy girls $35 mitts periodically. Um, so I, there's there's a lot of kids that that, uh, that might show up on your doorstep if you could if you could waive the 450. So we'll have to we we'll have to work through this, consider it, 
um, Walter's going to have some questions about uh, hockey that need to be answered. Um, is there anything else from the committee? I, to, to further one thing with that point, you know, even the pay to play has an option to waive it if a family can't afford pay to play. Mm -hmm. So we don't expect everyone at school to pay a $25 season fee, but they're supposed to pay $250 just to sign up, let alone their uniforms and everything else that goes with it. So, yeah, you know, I think that's a huge, huge comparison. Anything else? Yeah, I'll wait. Okay, um, let's move on. You good? Really appreciate you coming. We've got some things to work through. Thanks for hearing us out. Okay. Thank you for coming tonight. I understand the girls are playing soccer. If you hurry, you can make a kickoff. Yeah. <laughs> are we going to number one or are we going to uh, number four? Thank you, Mr. Hardy. We will start with number one graduation requirements. Um, we have Mr. McElhaney here and Mr. Heinrich. Um, last time we met, we presented some um, updates that we'd like to see the graduation requirements. Some additional information was requested from the administration to come back and just revisit what we're specifically looking at. And more importantly, how do we compare it to other school districts? So we have that information tonight. And I'd like to turn the floor over to Mr. Heinrich and Mr. McElhaney, who I think is at uh, Girls Soccer Night. So between my, Mr. Heinrich and myself, we'll navigate through the, what we have here in place. And we have a presentation we're going to pull up here momentarily, and we'll go from there. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring it up on the uh, screen here in just a second. Oh, sure. After. But That's right. He's asking for money. You say, oh, we came under, but. Well played, right? All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Vugovich. Last academic committee meeting, uh, Mr. McElhaney and Mr. Johnson presented uh, the graduation requirements updates for this school year. And the crux of that was the move to um, align to Act 158. Act 158 in Pennsylvania, just to bring everybody's, uh, to refresh everyone's memory, changes the way that students can uh, graduate high school in Pennsylvania. And essentially, there are five different pathways that students can take to graduate now. The first is keystone proficiency, which means if you pass all your classes and you score proficient, which is a 1500 or better on all three keystone exams, which is algebra one, English language arts and biology, the state will you know, grant you the you will state that you are ready to graduate. Um, the second option is keystone composite score which is you pass the algebra, but you didn't pass the biology and literature, but you scored high enough that the total composite or the average of those three scores is uh, a four, is the, or the total scores added together is a four, four, five, two score total. That total composite score, the state will say, if you passed all the affiliated course courses, you're good to graduate. Rob. Yes, sir. Go ahead. But where did they come up with four, five, five, two? That is what the state has decided that if you took what, if you pass one of the courses. But, but I'm talking about the numbers because it, it seems oh, right. it's, it's a mathematical algorithm. They basically figured out what is good enough by somebody's standards at 333 Market Street in Paris. <laughs> yes, sir. And those three numbers combined together give you four, four, five, two. Some bean counter. Well, probably <laughs> someone with our background. I mean, I mean that you know. I'll second that. Why did, why did they make it four, five, five, two? I mean, okay. Yeah, Dr. Rungi's correct. It's... You don't want to think about it. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 it doesn't make a whole... It's mathematical. It's mathematical. I'll turn it off then. Right. Yeah. And again, what I'm refer what I'm referring to here is state law. So this is what's now been passed. But go. Ahead. Um, I was a junior. So what's the maximum I can score in those two tests? I don't. No. I don't know off the top of my head. I want to say eighteen hundred, but it might even be higher than that. Maybe twenty four hundred. I have to. I'd have to look. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Um. 
So those are the first two options. So these are the, the most common options that most of our students are going to use. In fact, over 80% of our students will pass and be eligible for graduation on these first two options. The following, the next is career and technical education concentrator pathway, which is you can attain, you pass the, the classes associated with those keystones, but let's say you don't score high enough to pass the keystones themselves. If you earn an industry-based competency certification or demonstrate a high likelihood of success in an approved industry-based competency assessment or demonstrate a readiness for continued meaningful engagement in continuing education in career and technical uh, training, the state will deem you eligible for graduation. So that is, again, if you don't pass the keystones, how, but you pass the classes associated with those keystones, and then you're enrolled at the IC, ICTC, and you are a successful concentrator in one of those areas of expertise, the state will deem you ready to graduate. Miss Cindy, it looks like you have a question. You have a... No, we're good. Okay. This is pathway three. And again, this is under the, the Pennsylvania Changes to Act 158. These are all the different pathways that a student can, can earn graduation under the new law, which we now have to adopt our version of this and what this will look like here in Indiana. The fourth pathway is the alternative assessment. In, in lieu of passing the Keystone exam, they, the student would have to pass the associated course, right? So again, I, I don't maybe pass the uh, Algebra 1 Keystone, but I pass Algebra 1 the course itself, with a C or better. I pass uh, English 10 with a C or better. I pass biology with a C or better, but I don't quite hit that 1500 mark on the scores, and I don't quite have the 4452 total to reach the composite. I can, however, pass one of these alternative assessments, the ACT, a composite score of 21, the work keys at uh, gold level, the ASVAB at a score of 31, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. If I pass one of those alternate assessments, the state will deem me ready to graduate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I took the ACT in my junior year and got a 32 on it, I would have. This is the path I could check off, and I wouldn't have to worry about anything else as long as it gets C's on everything else. Absolutely, yes. Um, however, by that time, you would have taken the keystones already. So you would have, yes, but that's that's exactly right. If you did not pass the keystones, yes, that would be a, a you'll take the keystones anywhere between 8th grade and 10th grade usually for the first time. And if you need to be remediated, you'll take it again your junior and senior year if if necessary. Yeah, the keystone pathway is the is the like I said, eight over eighty percent, actually eighty four percent, I believe, of our students pass will will be eligible for graduation during the first two pathways, either passing the keystone exams or passing on a composite score. These other pathways come in after that as uh, as different means of of demonstrating proficiency. High score you can get is an eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred. So across three exams, it's six if I'm doing the math correctly. 6,400 is the highest number of composite score you can possibly get. That would be if you have perfect scores on all three. So the number that, whatever that number is, it's a combination of a minimally a proficient score on one and basic scores on the other two. And that's how they came up with that number. Yeah, so it's like, it's almost like getting a low C. Um, they, if you want to equate it to, to letter to grades, which is it's a true, reasonable but, comparison for our purposes here, it'd be like getting a B and two C's on the state exam. It's not quite the same comparison. But C minus. C minus. Sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So what's the fifth magic one? The fifth, the fifth pathway to graduation is the evidence-based pathway. Now, what the state says here are you have to present three different um, articles or, or pieces of evidence that show that you are ready to graduate at least one of those pieces of evidence has to come off this list, which is you know, right there, the uh, est uh, established score on the work keys, attainment of a score on an SAT subject test, et cetera, et cetera. I highlighted two there because um, you're going to also see later that we're talking about improving our dual enrollment 
and our college and high school offerings, successful completion of a concurrent enrollment class or a post-secondary course in itself is one of those pieces of evidence. So if you don't pass those keystone exams, however, you do take a college level course and pass that course, that could be one piece of evidence. So one of your pieces of evidence has to come off this list right here, and then up to two other pieces of evidence can come off of this list, which is um, a proficient score advanced on one of the keystones, satisfactory completion of an approved service learning project, et cetera, et cetera, full-time employment. And basically what the state is trying to say here is each one of our students does not follow the same path, right? We need to personalize our graduation requirements a little bit. We want all of our students to be proficient in math and English and science. However, we also understand that there is a great need for students to be career ready as well. So if you can demonstrate career readiness, rather than the college readiness, the state will grant you the uh, you know graduate status, I guess, um, through these different pathways, if that makes sense. Rob, is it fair to say this happened several years ago when a state came out and said, look, there's going to be eight keystones that kids have to pass. And rather than amending the law and changing the law, what they said was, OK, we're not going to change the bar. We're going to still require, require some level of proficiency, graduate exams, right, exit exams. But then I gave other means and alternatives to reach that goal. So this is one of issue of a, a code, PA code, right? The law is you have to have these um, passing scores to graduate high school. But they're saying, look, we can modify it to give them multiple ways. Because I think there's a good point. Like to me, if you could pass a college algebra class, I'm good. Uh, you know, I'm good. I'll take that over Keystone. I really will. So I think what they try to do is when they first started out, eight exams. And then you saw they really quickly pared it down um, to now the, the three that they have. And they're trying to give alternate pathways for kids to graduate. So I wouldn't look at it as lowering the bar. I was looking at it as giving multiple, multiple avenues in which to reach um, some sort of pr pr proficiency based upon their skill set, their interest, and and or their aptitude. Would you agree? One hundred percent. Yeah, this is not an effort to lower the bar. This is an effort to recognize students' personal interests and aptitudes for sure. Uh, satisfactory completion of an approved service learning project that could be huge, especially for this board. We talked about civics all the time. Uh, this is a huge way. <laughs> this is sorry. This is a huge way to really demonstrate proficiency in the area of a multitude of different ranges. But again, a kid who doesn't graduate from um, high school represents tragedy in both society and personally. But a kid who can graduate but not make good moral ethical decisions, detail or determine fact from fiction is even 10 times worse. So I like some of these additional pathways that give kids options that says, look, I'm more than a test score. I can demonstrate proficiency and I can be a productive citizen and make good moral ethical choices, tell determined fact from fiction. Because if you turn on Facebook any day of the week, you could find a whole bunch of misinformation out there. And what we have now is a society that deals with it constantly. And a lot of our conflict constantly is based and surrounded upon that. So when you talk to me about the issues, uh, of, of, you know, looking at these alternative pathways, I think there's some merit in them. Again, we have to have high standards to have high quality. So we're not just pushing kids through, but I do believe, and the, there's some value in different ways of dem demonstrating so, proficiency. So, so is it, is it fair then Mike to say that of this list of other alternatives, whether it's this number five or any of the others, we have some flexibility as a district as to, as far as what we will actually accept and it goes and i i would say i mean uh, i mean i i, I don't want to be yeah too sarcastic here but you know a, an a in a basket weaving class as a college level course is not necessarily the same as that c or b in algebra Agreed. english or history or or what have you Agreed. Um, and that's only one of the filters, right? That's only one of the filters. There's more, but you're right in that. I, I think you bring up a fair point with that. There is more than one criteria. I think it has we to We can yep. determine that, yep. what some of those finer details are at the district level. Yep. And we have. Um, and we're going to, we shared, I shared a document with you a few weeks back that kind of lays out what we called our Indiana Ready program, where we worked with local businesses, the Chamber of Commerce. We, 
identified the skills that our students would need to demonstrate in order for them to be ready for Indiana work. And uh, Mr. McHoney, Mr. Johnson led the charge on that and the whole crew at the uh, senior high school, all, a lot of teachers were involved um, working with these local businesses to identify what the what those skill sets look like. And it's mapped out now and I'll show it to you here in a second. Um, so you can see that the students that we're putting out are, this is not just a way to get out of the Keystone exams. This is a way to show, look, I'm ready to enter the workforce right now. I'm ready to graduate. And I would just add, there's some accountability. So please don't think this is lowering your bar. There's some high levels of accountability. The devil will be in the details to make sure we get it done right. And we set high quality, but I like it because it aligns to everything we're doing as a district. When you talk about career readiness and you talk about college and the high school, this is a nice capstone way to demonstrate proficiency. I think kids can demonstrate just like a kid could be gifted in multiple things. I think a kid can demonstrate proficiency in a multiple uh, multitude of avenues. Um, I think you're right. We have to have some sort of set of rigor and expectations, but I also think it comes at tiered levels, right? Eighth through 10th, the keystone, that doesn't work. We look at multiple other options for the kid to make sure they have a chance to be successful a pathway no, uh, to graduate. But my point is we have some control over these five different and 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 to ensure that they do have some minimal level in math and communication skills yes sir so is it possible because i can't keep track of all the pathways at the same time okay is it possible to totally not be successful i mean i don't want to say get a zero but to not be successful on the algebra the science and the literature keystones is it possible to be unsuccessful and still get through school? Yes, ma'am. It is on these on, under these rules. There's several different scenarios that could happen. Um, if you did not achieve proficiency in any of those courses, you would be looking at one of the pathways, either three, four, or five that I laid out here, um, to find your pathway to graduation. Because I, I thought I saw in all of them there was a possibility, like in this one, there's still the attainment of profession or advanced on a keystone. The keystone keeps Correct. slipping so, in there, but there is there is enough flexibility that you could not sure. be able to do math, not be able to do literature, not know anything about science, and still get through school. Yes, but you'd still have to pass the associated courses. Mm -hmm. So you would have to pass the, the Algebra one class. You have to pass biology. You have to pass our English 10 course at the very least and then the idea is that you you just don't take that high stakes test real well so now you have to show look i passed the coursework i am going to demonstrate proficiency through one of these other pathways it's a c and under r what we're recommending is you have to pass with a c or better i think it's c within i gotta verify it with for the for you yes ma'am At the very least, yes, sir. Correct. And well, no, that's not true. You could pass um, if you are a student with special needs, as long as you successfully complete your individual education plan under those guidelines, you could pass, you could graduate that way as well. Yes, sir. Another one, not to muddy the waters even further. Don't think about this as just a kids who can't pass the course. You have a lot of kids who um, exempt from these PSSAs or keystones for religious beliefs, right? And they are quite capable of. So this is not one have versus have nots. This is some who may not take it, and we have to have some sort of um, credibility or alignment that evidence that shows they still meet the minimum graduate standards. Because when you look at a keystone, if you look at the heart of a keystone or PSSA, it truly is the minimum standards of what's expected at that particular grade level. So. That's why I'm okay with this because we do have even a lot of kids who do out, opt out of a PSSA and or Keystones. I think this is the state trying to give us some flexibility to show different ways of proficiency in, in different manners. And again, if they pass an AP course with a three or higher or if they take a college algebra course and they demonstrate a C or higher, I'm I'm just as well as good with that. I really am. I mean, one of the big determin determining factors of kids successful in college most studies based off algebra one, right? Most studies based off algebra one. So if a kid can do an algebra one college algebra work, to me, that's equivalent to a keystone, proficient keystone score in my, in my um, humble opinion.
I agree. And what is what is a better measure of students ready for college, whether they pass a test that says they are or actual success in a college class? What says the student is ready for career, passing a test or actual gainful employment with, uh, you know, with an industry certification? So I think what the state has done here is is in, is smart. Um, it does. It's more in tune with a lot of students uh, varying needs. It's a little bit more personalized. It's a little bit more flexible. And uh, I think it's in the, you know, they, they're on the right track here with Act 158. So um, one of the board members in, the earlier, in an earlier meeting asked, I want to see the list of the classes that they have to pass to get, you know, to graduate in Pennsylvania. And it was true. The law used to have a list of courses that you had to take. You had to get so many credits in this and so many credits in that. The law has changed. This is now the current law that I'm sharing, and it, and it basically says that you have to demonstrate proficiency through one of those pathways, right? And all high school programs have to include the following areas. And they can either include this in a full credit course or units within those course, and they have to meet the standard. So, um, and for example, health and physical education, which we're gonna talk about here in a second, Last year, when you voted to reduce the credit requirements from two credits to 1.5 credits, that was because we hit all of the, st the standards. We cover all the standards in the first three years of health and phys ed. That last year of phys ed was a requirement, but it's just phys ed. It's just a, uh, you know, they're just playing badminton or they're doing yoga or they're doing physical type things. All of the standards have been met and there is no graduation requirement set by the state for that extra credit. As long as, in fact, the state doesn't say you have to have any credits in health or phys ed or anything else. They just say you need to show proficiency in those standards. And then you have to show proficiency in the standards through a, a credit-bearing class or through units of study in the following areas. And that's language, arts, mathematics. And these are all listed to which, how, you know, how far you need to get. Science and technology and social studies. Environment and the eco and ecology. The arts, the use of applications and microcomputers and software, health, safety, and physical education, family consumer science. Those are the things that we have to meet the state standards for, whether it, we do it in a one credit class or whether we have four credits over four years. That's what the state lays out. So there's no list of courses that you have to take in Pennsylvania any longer. It's simply you have to show proficiency on one of these pathways and you have to meet the standards in all of those subjects that I just talked about. Any questions about that before we move on? Yes, yes sir. In the past, we had to do so many credits to get to the in order to study proper cookbook. Yep. So what they're doing now is they're saying, here's the nine things that you have to master. You figure it out. Correct. Yes, sir. So we want to do, uh, so there is no nope now it's all about that proficiency you're going to demonstrate that you're either college or career ready by through one of those pathways and we as the school board are going to make sure that there is a robust education with all of these areas you know addressed up to the standards set forth by pde so we just have to make sure that we hit all those standards now that said and then we have to also offer and make available to all of our students vocational technical education business education, world languages, technology education. We, we may offer college level and advanced placement courses. Um, so these are the things that we need to make available for our students but are not required to meet any standard in. So what does that mean for Indiana graduates? These are the current graduation requirements. We're not recommending that any of these credit requirements change. We want them to remain the same. And we've discussed it at you know, multiple levels, looking at these credit requirements and what they translate to. And we're pretty comfortable with these credits being the way they are. And we'll explain some of the key differences and details as to why. Um, if you see there, you have four credits of English. That is because we believe that it takes four classes in English language arts to thoroughly cover all of the standards set forth by the state in English. Three credits of math. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. That's a full year course. One credit is a full year course. Half a credit is a half year course. 0.25 credits would be a nine week course. So we believe that it takes four full year classes in English language arts to thoroughly cover all of the standards set forth by the state in English. In math, we believe that it takes three credits, three full year courses. In science, three, and so on and so forth down the line here. That's, and we feel comfortable that those credit requirements do accurately ref reflect what it would take for our students to master all of the standards. Now, we are asking, however, for a few changes made by the board here as we go through. You'll see there, mathematics number one. And you already addressed this, but the law changed where Pennsylvania has now accepted personal finance to replace one of the math credits. So let's say you have a student who gets through algebra one and they pass their keystone, but we currently require them to get three credits in math. And let's say they struggle with algebra two, they can't quite pass algebra two or they can't quite grasp geometry. After taking those courses, they could take personal finance one and personal finance two, which are two semester courses. So the two half credit courses. And if they pass those two classes, we can replace one of those math credits with personal finance. A student could also, if they have an interest in personal finance, can take personal finance as early as their sophomore year as electives and work through that and then bank that. But that, then that credit would count as elective credits, not necessarily their math requirement. Or they can do both. They can take those the, uh, the personal finance credits when they get to the end they're still, uh, they come up a credit short, those personal finance classes that they took in their sophomore and junior years could replace one of those credits at the end. So it provides a little bit more flexibility uh, to the math requirements. And, uh, you know, that's that's dictated by law. We just adjusted our, our requirements to satisfy that law. Uh, after Algebra 1, they, we, they have to pass Algebra 1. Right. Or they have to find one of those other pathways if they have an IEP or something, but they have to pass algebra one nine. You know, the overwhelming majority of our students have to pass algebra one beyond that. They could replace one of their math credits with this personal finance one and two. Yeah, they have to pass both one and two to get that full credit of math. And again, here's the other thing, too. This is key. The nice thing about these pathways to graduation is it provides our counselors a little bit more flexibility in advising our students and our families on how what what pathway they should take and what classes they should take based on their interests. If you're coming, if you're a student who says, look, I'm going to college, college is my goal, we would never recommend personal finance replace one of your math credits. We would say, listen, you got to take four years of math. You have to take Algebra one, algebra two, geometry and trigonometry and maybe calculus if you can get it in just to make sure that you're ready for the, the rigor of college math. If you're saying, look, I'm not going to college, you know, I'm uh, I'm a student, I'm in welding, I'm going to run my own business. You know, they're going to steer you toward the business math or something or you know, get you to a certain point. They're going to the counselors are going to recommend which math classes you take based on your own personal goals and and aptitudes. And, here, so. and, and Rob, yes, sir. We currently offer now a course in general statistics in the math program. Is that correct? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, moving on. In science, number two. The state also just changed the law to say that in science, you can replace one of the more traditional sciences, one of the biological sciences, with a science and technology, specifically. One of our students in our school could take science of engineering and computer aided drafting to replace one of their science requ requirements. So instead of taking, um, you know, maybe uh, chemistry or something like that, they could take your uh, science of engineering and computer aided drafting, but they still need to pass. <laughs> Thank you. So they, they still have to pass biology. Right, they have to pass that and preferably pass the bio keystone, but in lieu of one of those later credits, they can take science of engineering and computer aided drafting if that's more in line with what they want to do. Again, the counselors will advise them accordingly. Well, 
Uh, well, I'm not sure if science of engineering, that's a pretty rigorous course from what I understand. I mean, the, and computer drafting is too. So if it's, you know, I, I mean, it's, you can't just not want to do anything in science. I mean, you got to have something. Sure. I, I agree with you. It was my mission in life to avoid math at all costs, right? <laughs> and, uh, no. But, 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 Julia, that's the reason I ask about the statistics course. Because if you're going to study history, almost any kind of research is going to require some statistical background, regardless of, even if it's a social studies course. I had a guaranteed seat. Okay. So, so. But, but we're only requiring three math classes. That's the requirement. Currently, yes, sir. I could, I could, I could. I could do that and do whatever I please and not do the fourth year of math. Correct. Or you could replace your third year of math with personal finance one and two, if necessary. Yes, sir. So, so, so Julia could avoid, avoid the fourth year of math and take another English class. Sure. I really like what they did here, especially in science. A kid who may want to be an engineer, an architect, something of that robust nature now has an ability to take a science program, something of that their liking, right? We talk a lot about personalized learning, and we usually equate that to a computer system. This is a neat way of saying, look, if this is where you want to be, and this is one of this is your career goal, here's a way to get you along, um, get you along that way, but also something you're interested in. So I think there's some, I, I think there's some flexibility here. That's been long overdue. We, for a long time in public education, expected every kid to fit the one single same mold when each and every kid's different. This allows a kid now to hopefully, ha if with our career readiness work and our career aspirations, we give kids options to find something that they like, something that could be successful, and something that's aligned to their career goals and, and efforts, in, in my opinion. Well, you know, the thing about this is that do you have two levels of stats? Like, I know what you're saying. It's beneficial to have economics and have a basic course in statistics. But if you're going to be guaranteed, you can't have what's the point? Oh, agreed. Yeah. And, and that's it. See, I, I think in the past, Julia, the, it was mostly AP stats, and then wasn't there one on sports statistics? No, Wait, there, there was a course statistics in sports. There was an object one time, but that teacher retired, and that was a special of his. So we have Scott Layden now, who does not only AP stats, but also general statistics course. And that one be, would be geared towards somebody that Julia's mentioning that 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 needs the general statistics but doesn't really need to get the at the collegiate level to to deal with it. Is that correct? Wait, you need to speak in the mic there the there was a complaint that they can't hear you. Currently offer the AP statistics course and the general statistics class as well. And the general statistics class is also one of our new CHS college and high school courses. Okay. So all I'm saying is that there's some great math classes out there. The reason people don't get better at math is because when you're starting to think seriously about what you might do when you're 18, and you're looking at this and you're saying, it's like taking physics versus stats. Well, I'm doomed. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, I agree. I would have been that same kid. I'd have been like. You don't want to get your grade point up screwed up for that, so that you can't end up in college where you want to go. I mean, it's just a game. Just, I just, I, I don't know if we fail them in the front end or if we're failing them in the back end. It's sure. Fine. Or if you want to be an engineer and you don't want to take anatomy because anatomy, your senior just doesn't make any sense to you and as a career choice. This is a really viable choice right here. You can go and do computer aided drafting because that is going to prepare you better for your college program than anatomy would, you know, so it gives students some flexibility, some choice and some real alignment to what their interests are. The science engineering is, is a two semester class? Uh, no, it's a one semester class. Both of those are one semester. One semester. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. My concern, my concern with, with that is the difficulty of getting through 10 as compared to your old chemistry class. Not the, not the AP in the chemistry class, but the, uh, what's the doctor's name? Dr. Wilhelmy? Dr. Wilhelmy. Okay. 
that class required a tremendous amount of effort and, and coordination by our general population. My concern is that the CAD class in one semester can't even get close to that kind of rigor. Okay, and you don't have enough contact time in a CAD class to, to get much beyond, okay, this is where the machine is, this is the on button. Um, um, well, that would help. I, it, it helps, but, but my, my concern is that is I don't want to see an advanced class like chemistry, like Dr. Wilhelm's chemistry, okay, be washed down to a very simplified you know that's not the that's not the goal the goal on this one is more to have students take classes that are more relevant to their future goals okay. but, yeah but the class dr wallamy's class required you to show up and do the work and learn a different language and he did it every day for years okay. and it was a general chemistry class and my concern is that is that we're, we, we should we need to be careful about substituting out classes that are cakewalks, that Mr. Harley. So it is biased. It is biased. It is. Biased. I don't. I don't know that. I never took I computer know. drafting. I don't think that would be a cakewalk. Okay. Mr. Harley, I would. I would say that um, the way in which CAD is instructed at our school of science and engineering are not cake classes. I think they challenge the kids accordingly. I think that the AP chemistry or honors chemistry class, uh, Dr. Wilmy taught at one, or the honors chemistry class, it was a different rigor for a different subject area. I think that the um, science of engineering and the CAD courses offer a different type of rigor for students who are pursuing that. Um, I don't think you can equate the rigor necessarily mm -hmm. because the honors chemistry is is for those students who are pursuing, you know, the AP chemistry, pursuing. Was Dr. Wilmy honors chemistry, but not AP. Dr. Wilmy was honors. Uh, Mr. Pelko was AP. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there was a general chemistry course that was. Okay. Correct. I'm There's, sorry. Yeah. Morgan. Can we restrict the last five minutes of my rambling? <laughs> um, I'll throw a plug in for personal finance because um, to me that gets a bad rep but i think it's absolutely critical and important today in age when you look at people who graduate 18 try to get married go buy a car uh, there's fortune 500 companies make good deal of money off of uh rent -a centers and places like them people know good credit from bad credit um, money touches everything so i think don't diminish or poo poo um, the value of personal finance also not understanding personal finance can have painful consequences not only uh financially academically uh, social, emotionally, um, divorces, right? Uh, all kinds of things. You look at the health system, right? We could talk for years about that, how that impacts it. And lastly, or the opposite, it could lead to a healthier life, uh, right? Be able to access different things, be able to take your family on vacation, understand how to budget accordingly. So um, again, I think personal finance long overdue should be required in Commonwealth. I think it's something all kids need. I think it's valuable. The devil's in the details again. Uh, the, the good news is we have great teachers and great leadership at the high school that they'll make sure they get it done and make sure it's rigorous. Um, it's no different than what we talk about with college debt. We're at a point now where college debt has surpassed credit card debt. And this is all relates to personal finances and understanding that and interest rates and understanding what we're really into as a society. So I just want to throw that comment out there. Mike, if I may, um, my, my middle daughter, who is now 32-ish, wishes that that course was available to her as she's making decisions that, you know, she's learning about things that, 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 that we could have talked that, that she didn't learn here. And, and I'll agree with you. And she had two great parents. Imagine if people grew up like me though, right? Try filling out a FAFSA form at 18 on your own, right? I, I tried. Right. I mean, it's, it's quite difficult. So there is a need for some of these kids to have this knowledge. So they're not, uh, preyed upon by some of these outside companies. And again, I'm not trying to bash Rena Centers or the, uh, I can't remember, there, there's another place. Yes. Agreed, agreed. So it, it's so important. Paycheck days. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. So I'm glad. I thought we were going to have a fight about uh, personal fights. I feel better now. All right. <laughs> J.G. Wentworth, you know. <laughs> 
Okay, you know. Don't forget errands and uh, reverse mortgage loans and all that fun stuff. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Sammy. See, I'm Wait. awake. <laughs> Social studies is one of the areas last time when we presented um, that the board pushed back and said, look, we're not okay with this. And we want you guys to look and come up with some alternatives uh, to what we currently um, hold our students to. The current rule is, in, in the in the board-approved course of study right now, students participating in a three-year Indiana County Technology Program will be required to only complete three credits in social studies. The board expressed a great desire to change that uh, moving forward. Uh, Mr. McElhaney, Mr. Johnson, and I put our heads together. They, okay. The, uh, <laughs> we put our heads together and we came up with this idea working with the, the teachers. Those students that go to the Indiana County Technology Center already as by nature of their program there, get a lot of the career readiness stuff that we offer in our classes at our, our on your own course and our career college ready workforce um, class that, that we're implementing. They also get a lot of hands-on technical training in computer programs specific to their individual field so what we're recommending then because this is put in to to basically free up their schedule so they can attend ictc and when you're looking at well what do we cut do we cut math do we cut english social studies has always been the easy place to to slice if we now change this to be Students that are in those three-year programs can be excused from the credit requirements for the career readiness and the computer applications because it will be somewhat redundant. We then will free up some time their senior year to take that fourth social studies. Um, and that is what we would recommend as the alternative to the current language if, uh, if it pleases the board. Mr. McLean, you have the, a comment? Yeah, I have a comment. Um... With the Future Ready PA Index, the requirement that our students complete a minimum of eight career readiness artifacts. Working with ICTC, um, they were able to assure us that indeed ICTC would take care of the artifacts up there, the career readiness artifacts that all students are doing now. That will keep the students up there um, without having to come back that period uh, for career readiness. So ICTC said minimally they will be doing eight different activities that will count for those career readiness. So that will suffice in that regard. Plus, ICTC, I believe in itself, that program is career readiness for that student who has demonstrated an affinity, aptitude, or interest to go in that direction. So I would open it up here since this is a little bit different. We would change this for the board meeting for next Monday because we're going to ask you to approve these graduation requirements. Would this please the board if we change that requirement from we're excused from the fourth credit of social studies to students in the ICTC are excused from the career readiness and computer applications requirements here in Indiana. And again, this is just to free up their schedule enough that they can take that uh, take that ICTC program that eats up half of the half of their day. Josie seems to be having some technical difficulties. Yes, sir. Okay. I absolutely don't know what's wrong. You're technically challenged. Indeed, the whole evening has been technically challenging. Okay. I'd like to thank Mr. McElhaney for working in that component for the ICTC students. I, I think it's absolutely vital that they be included in civics education, and I think that that is very commendable. Um, <clears throat> I look forward to working with, of course, having that graduation requirement Perhaps in the junior year, we will see, but I really thank him and his staff for that, coming to that 
conclusion that ICTC should not be excluded. They're part of the uh, Indiana District family. They're part of our, our civics education. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Then, Ms. Harley, if you don't mind, we will add some language to the graduation requirements for next Monday night that will say that will change it from students participating in a three year county to Indiana County Technology Program were required to complete four credits of social studies, but will be excused from the career readiness and computer applications requirement. All right. Uh, rather than excused, uh, perhaps to, to continue the emphasis on the career readiness and computer, um, something to the effect that will be substituted by their work at the ICTC sure. or, or some language to indicate that they're getting it from that different source. Absolutely. Good. Idea. It's good. Career readiness and computer applications. Those are one semester courses again. Correct. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, moving on. Number. Oh, going back. Yes, sir. And all the students are going to take the four credits. Yes, sir. So there will be a social studies class in basically the senior year. Yes, sir. There already is social studies classes the, the senior year. However, the ICTC students will now take that social studies course. And that scope and sequence will change. Again, I, we've been working, we've been talking about civics education. We've been talking about what are we going to do to better address our civics, you know, literacy, civic literacy in this in this area and across the country. We are working with the social studies department to figure out how, what that's gonna look like. We will bring that to you later. We do not have that, we'll not have that by Monday. However, we will have something for you soon um, that will, a new scope and sequence for you to consider and approve. And you know, so we'll have some options for you here soon. Okay. Yep. All right, now moving on. Health and physical education. You've already approved this, but I wanted to bring it back because there was a question raised at the last meeting about why would we reduce uh, HPE credits um, when we have an obesity problem in America? And the answer is we've already, by the senior year, we've already addressed all of the health, safety, and physical education standards. And that last year of physical education is something that not all students need and not all students want and that's a half, you know, it's a nine week course that they could be used, uh, that could be used to uh, take a different elective that's gonna be more in line with their needs. Um, this has already been approved, but it is, since it's a change from last year's book, I just wanted to bring it back up um, as to why that was the way it was. Um, computer technology, oh, I'm sorry, go back. I just wanted to say, um, we were wondering what the effect would be on scheduling. And we still, have a, a good number of seniors took the senior PE, they enjoy that. Um, I think also it's it's a it's a nice change in their day to take a physical education course, but uh, we still have a number of seniors who still take that. It's it's very popular with them. So playground for seniors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a nice uh, self care they, break in the day. Right? They have the they have the traditional PE. They have personal fitness, which is goal based individual. And then they also have now the yoga class. When do we approve that? Why? Well, just want to see the other. Computer technology. Uh, all students must pass a computer applications course to graduate from high school. That's laid out in the graduation requirements by the state. Well, they don't say that we have to pass a class, they say we have to meet the, the standards in computer technology. Uh, computer technology credits already count for students at the ICTC for those areas there, uh, network communications, technology center, digital media, graphics and electric media, and machine technology. However, we are now saying that with that exception for social studies, we will accept um, their work at, at the ICTC to satisfy that computer technology requirement. Okay. Number six, family consumer science um, and business technology. All students must successfully complete a half year credit of on your own or child development. Depending on which year you are, this which graduation cohort you're in, that graduation credit will look different. If you are beginning with a class of 2023, you're gonna be required to take the 0.5 half year course in career and work readiness during their junior or senior year of high school. 
students who are graduating in 2021 or 2022 will already have met that requirement passing that on your own course that we used to have in the freshman year of, uh, of high school. Again, here there might be some exceptions made for ICTC students for that uh, career readiness piece um, if we change the, the to open it up for social studies. Yes, sir. I've already taken one of these two classes. Yes, sir. If they want to take on your own, so if they want to take current work readiness, that would be an elective. They, yes. And they could do that. And that's my understanding. Yes, Mr. McElhinney? Mr. McElhinney is... The first year in its existence, it was offered as an elective. We had students signing up for it. It was a section or two of it. As it becomes the requirement, we'll have more students in it. And if they've taken on your own already, then they've met that requirement for uh, family consumer science. Um, just one other thing. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, other requirements. Um, and these are things that we have um, laid out here in that document I shared with you before. Uh, beginning with graduating class of 2019, all students must complete a designated career readiness artifact activities. Now that's law again we have to do that we have to collect artifacts that show that we have prepared all of our students for career readiness and we have to collect so many each year all the way from kindergarten up through 12th grade and we have to show the state that we have collected these artifacts where that's we can't just talk about you know looking for a job we actually have to lead them through an activity that shows them how to look for a job and we have to collect some sort of artifact from the student that says they have they they went through this activity and and uh, experienced it. Um, so that's part of that uh, future ready index uh, for the state. Beginning with uh, 2022, all students must complete the Indiana senior area Indiana area senior high school ready graduation culminating project. Now that's what I shared with you before, and I'll show it here to you again just to, to highlight some of the things. But this is the big project that. Mr. McElhinney and Mr. Johnson have led at the high school with a, a whole team of teachers. They worked very, very hard with uh, representatives from the state, the Chamber of Commerce, and the local businesses, again, to make sure that our students are career ready in uh, what we consider career ready here in Indiana. And that is a continuation of our social emotional learning program that we, you know, from the time they're little kids and we were teaching them to uh, uh, in paths to deal with their own emotions a little bit better. Then they get to junior high and they learn about decision making and not caving into peer pressure. Then they get to the senior high and social emotional learning transform, transforms and really manifests itself as career readiness because that's what emotional control, social emotional control and social emotional competencies really equate to is can I get along with people? Can I be part of a team? Can I communicate? Can I take criticism? Can I, you know, all of those things that we teach from the time they're little now become actual career competencies. And uh, Mr. Mako and his team has really done a great job laying this out. And uh, they have a formula for each one, how the students, uh, all the things the students need to do to show that they're proficient in communication, in responsibility, in um, reliability. And all of these things are laid out and, and explicitly shown. This is what you have to do to show, to demonstrate proficiency in these areas. They've done such a nice job tying and making this not only in line with the national and state priorities, but they've done such a nice job tying it to our local initiative that they've been invited to some a national conference to demonstrate to to present this um, because it's that it's that well done. Um, so we're going to ask you to approve that tonight. And remember, we can always tweak it down the road, and then I'll show you why we might want to consider that here in a moment. But that um, Indiana Ready portion of the culminating project is also a graduation requirement layer that is going to show that our students and to, uh, to Walter's point earlier about we can pick what those things look like on those different pathways. This is where we this team has done a fantastic job of really identifying what those things look like. Um, so we'll show you that here in a second. ICT students will be exempted. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's not a credit course, but it's well, it's tied to a couple courses. But this is these are the things that would happen throughout from your ninth grade year through your 12th grade year. You will collect these artifacts that then will show that you are indeed career ready or Indiana ready. 
Um, so it's a little bit the, the career and readiness, uh, career readiness class that they take in their junior senior year is a big piece of that. But we also have pieces at, in a bunch of different classes throughout their time that will have artifacts that will lead to this culminating project. Yes, sir. Um, they have career counselors at the each high school. So each group of students is is assigned to a career counselor that they will meet with at certain times throughout their career and who will just keep track of how you're doing here, you know, making sure that they have uh, have met the requirements all the way through. Is a career counselor a counselor or is a career counselor? I'm pointing at you because you, you're going to answer that question. <laughs> it's a combination. No, sir. Sorry. It's a combination of both. Once a week, we have what's called our CCER period, College Career Employment Readiness period. It occurs on Fridays. It's uh, We have a shortened afternoon for that period. We have a shortened um, periods in the morning for clubs. So it was like it's complement to the afternoon. The school counselors um, are developing lessons for CCE, CCER as well as Sarah Jewett and Eric Brocious as well. The, um, the lessons are completed during the CCER period that time. The, that's facilitated by those teachers who we call the CCER advisors. So they're facilitating the completion of those activities. Those students are in groups of, I'd say around 16 to 18 students and they stay with the same person all four years. So that teacher or that advisor gets to see the growth of that student and guide them through that IHS ready project. And if I could, I just want to give Mr. Rung, or excuse me, Dr. Rungi uh, credit. We met early on and we were talking about PBIS and we were talking about a natural fit for senior high school students. And the career readiness seemed to be the place where we could really build on that. So there's a component for that in this program. And as Mr. Heinrich said, each one of these is, I think, poised and ready to build out further if we want to do that. But we wanted to uh, first get this up and going um, and then and then be able to build on it thereafter. Sammy, your, your hand's up. Go ahead. She pulled the, uh, <laughs> I'm going to unmute myself and I clicked the big red phone instead of the uh, unmute button. Yes, sir. Um, so ICTC students will be exempt from completing these career readiness programs because they get that through the ICTC again. And again, what we just talked about is school counselors and those CCER advisors will support the students along the way and make sure that they meet all of these requirements before they are ready to graduate. Is that Mrs. Blank back? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I would go to hit the uh, mic and I hang up every time. Um, Nobody else has ever done that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, it's so unusual. Um, I just wanted to let you know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, a lot of times my kids will, or other students will get on the career, ready, career readiness site and it will crash. And so we have a problem with maintaining the numbers on that server. Uh, Ms. Blank, apparently uh, one yeah. of the, my kids who just chimed in said they don't even know their login. So, <laughs> no, Ms. Blank, you're right. Um, the last times that we had students log on, it did crash. So, Mr. O'Neill uh, has asked, asked for the contact of the company to ensure when we get on this uh, Smart Futures program, indeed, the students will be able to get on. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I kind of figured that might be what was going on. Okay. okay. Um, the next uh, series of requirements, uh, again, we have to adopt these pathways to graduation. That will apply to the class of 2023. Um, we do want to bring to attention that we still, the number one pathway is still passing those keystone exams. And, and we will still continue to schedule students who are not proficient on the keystone exams to be enrolled in those intervention programs to uh, remediate those students before they take the test again. Um, so, you know, so if you don't pass the Keystone Algebra, you will be enrolled in a in an intervention program to remediate before you take it the second time. Yes. yes. And that's part of the reason. But the other reason why I want the students here, because math is a success of learning experience. We want them to have a strong Algebra 1 base to move on to the learning. 
And same with literature or English. We know that if we address those deficiencies there, that will help them as they move on to 11th and 12th grades. And we feel that the biology is a life science. And minimally, we want those students to be able to demonstrate a proficient level of understanding when they walk out the door when they graduate. Thank you, sir. Um, again, we mentioned this earlier, but students who have special needs will who successfully complete their uh, program developed by the, the Individualized Education Plan um, will be eligible for graduation. Um, and that applies to, you know, anyone who meets the requirements under the law. Um, additional proposed changes. These are two big, big pieces that everyone needs to understand. We are asking the board to approve effective immediately courses for which credit is earned at an accredited college or university be counted as a credit toward graduation for its associated class or its affiliated class here at Indiana Area School District. Now, this is, um, so if you take a class at IUP, currently that class counts as an elective. What we're asking the board, uh, the board's request is that class, so let's say I take an English class at IUP, an English writing class, that class could then count toward graduation requirement for English at the senior high school. Now, there is some concern of we're working with the union right now to make sure that there's an MOU that passes because it would be unlawful for us to reduce any staff while we're using that program because that would be subcontracting union work. So we're going to ask, most likely we'll bring an MOU to, your, uh, to you to approve also Monday, hopefully, that will say we will not reduce staff and we'll reduce, we'll cut the program before we reduce staff. It's kind of a, a just a, uh, it's kind of window dressing. It's not legal. We'd have to do it anyway. Um, so if they would, sue, if you would reduce staff and have those kids go into IUP, they would have a slam dunk grievance against us that would end up, you know, you wouldn't be able to furlough anyone anyway. But if we, uh, we, we're going to ask you to sign the MOU just as a sign of good faith that, look, that is not our intention. Our intention is not to subcontract union work. Our intention is to provide opportunities for our students to take these college level classes, get the, that college experience, and not waste their time and have to come back and take the same English class here in our school just because we say so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it would last forever because it's law. Uh, you, they, it's they, once again the MOU is more is merely just a, a sign of good faith. It is illegal. It would be illegal for you to furlough anyone while we're having IUP teachers teach the same classes our our teachers could teach. They wouldn't let you furlough anybody. They would win that lawsuit. So that's what our lawyer is saying. Mr. Repack is saying, "Look, I'll write up the MOU for you." Well, if it's different, if it's different, it won't count for a graduation class. So if it's the same class, it'll count for graduation class requ requirement. If let's say they take uh, basket weaving, if they take basket weaving, they can go ahead and take that. But that's only going to count as a as an elective course. It's not going to count for a, a graduation credit. Yes, sir. Going back to you're talking about furloughing staff. Are you talking about overall staff reduction? Um, not necessarily. We, if um, if the union could demonstrate that the outside program was taking enough of a population that required us to not fill a position, they would win that suit. Is the is the argument that our lawyer is telling us? They're saying, look, this is not a necessary thing, but the the association felt their members would feel much more comfortable with this if we put it in writing to say look we will not reduce staff so we will most likely be bringing you an mou next week to that effect the class is a dozen years from now or 120 kids and we have excess staff we, we'd be troubles. we'd be required to cut the program before we cut the staff member that's correct because that would be because that would be yeah the number of high school teachers at that figure forever no. not necessarily so we would say like for example if we have so many students taking english at iup we could not reduce the english staff 
if they if we have students taking that now if we have one student or two students taking iup english in this county that would not be you know necessarily say we couldn't reduce the staff three examples there's 120 kids and three of them are taking less than iup we still can have that discussion yes sir absolutely there are 200 kids in the class yeah okay okay that's the future board problem okay <laughs> Fair, fair point. And yeah, we can discuss the MOU in greater length next week. I just, you know, I just want to let you know that it is coming. Um, you can approve this regardless of on Monday, but we wanted to let you know that we are working with the, the association to make sure that this is not seen as a move to reduce staff. Um, do you have the MOU for Monday? Um, with, I'm hoping. Yes, sir. We have it written up. They, the uh, association has it with their executive committee and they should vote on it this week. I'm trying not to. Uh, we'll go very quickly, and then we have two more things we have to cover. I'm sorry. Anyway, so uh, real quick, the one key thing here is that the waiting for these classes will not count. Immediately, these courses could could take effect. So right now, a student enrolled in an IUP course in English could get graduation credit for that. However, there will be no additional waiting given to that student until the graduating class of 2025. That's our current freshman class. And the reason for that is quite simple. If we change the graduation quality points midstream, you're going to get end up with a lawsuit because so and so ended up as a valedictorian because of the new weight changes, and it'll look like favoritism. So the easiest thing is the weighting doesn't change until the next uh, like or next class with no weighting applied, which is our freshman right now. And those credits and those quality points will be assigned as as uh, listed there. Um, effective immediately, we're also asking that the board waive the requirement to uh, take the AP exam if you take the AP course. Currently, we force students to take the AP exam if they enroll in the course. And the idea behind that is to keep the student engaged and, uh, you know, make sure that they're working toward that goal. We are going to advise the students, if you're taking this AP course and you want it to count for credit, you're going to want to take the AP exam. However, we also don't want the AP exam, which is, has a cost with it, to be a barrier to education as well. So if you want to expose yourself to that rigor, but you don't necessarily want it to translate to, to, call, to a graduation requirement, or I'm sorry, to a college credit, you don't need to take that exam. So we're asking that we make that an optional um, addition to the course instead of a requirement. Rob, well, very quickly on that. Um, I understand there was possibly some discussion that some of these AP courses uh, would be turned into IUP or Westmoreland or yes sir uh, and get actual credit for them without taking the AP exam is that is that still in the work yes sir we are looking to expand our, our enrollment or our options there in fact Mr. McElhaney's team have increased it by seven new classes that have been added some of them may be AP classes that are that are the uh the correlated class some might just be regular classes but there are seven new classes that we're adding to Westmoreland Community College and or Mount Aloysius or IUP where students can earn college credit in our schools in college and high school classes. So yes. Um, and finally, the, uh, the student who successfully completes required coursework early and quickly could be eligible for early graduation. And this is because we have a few students who are extreme, extraordinarily bright and have earned a lot of classes in our high school that are, even when they were in middle school in our junior high, and are have very quickly worked through all the graduation requirements that we have to offer. And our requirement that they complete that fourth year of college is really doing nothing but hold them back. So what we're asking is to say, if they've met all the requirements for graduation by their junior year, we allow them to graduate early with that cohort of class. When they've earned the credit, if they wanna graduate and they're ready to go to college, we will let them graduate. Yes, sir. If they, if they earn the credit, they can graduate, regardless of what they're doing. Yes, sir. Not that they go to college. It's just or whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Why do you make a senior year? If somebody gets done in sophomore and a half a year, can they go ahead and graduate? They could, but you have to earn 24 credits, so it would be really hard to do that by yourself when you're mathematically. Well, we'll work. Well, yeah, we'll figure that out. But, it, yes, all we're doing is asking for permission to graduate early because the board has to approve that option. So if you want to make that option available, we can do that. I really very quickly included here, and, I, and this is linked to your uh, to your agenda, so you can look at it. What other schools in this area um, who we 
think of of uh, having their their act together. What they what they require. This is Pine Richland. Uh, here is Northern Allegheny, and this is Fox Chapel. And you'll see that their graduation requirements are very very similar to what we are offering here at Indiana. So we are competitive with you know the uh, the other very very good school districts in this area. So basically, what we're asking are three things to be approved next Monday. Number one. The pathways to graduation to align our graduation credits or requirements with Act 158, which is required by law. And I think, you know, we laid all those out already. We're asking to approve the culminating project that Indiana Area Ready, which is that social emotional learning, career readiness. Here's all the things you have to do to show that you are proficient and ready to graduate and will enter our workforce and be Indiana Ready. And then finally, those recommended changes concerning dual enrollment. AP exams, quality points, et cetera, as presented. We believe that this plan is, is rigorous and flexible and personalized and in line with national and state priorities and keeping that local relevance, which is why Mr. McElwain and his team have been invited, invited to speak at that national conference because it's that good, the work that they've done. So just a little plug to the, the teachers at the junior or at the senior high and Mr. McElwain and his team. So other th items to con consider in the future, um, things that we considered but we did not uh, add. We talked about service learning project guidelines, making them more stringent. Our Indiana Ready piece has community service built in, and it requires 10 hours of community service. We considered and or will continue to consider making those uh, requirements a little bit more uh, geared towards certain areas of the community or requirements uh, that are a little more strict. But uh, at this point, we're just asking you to approve it as written in the uh, in the guide. We considered public speaking, but we consider that that's covered in our other classes. We talked about adding code, a coding or a STEM requirement, a fourth year of math, um, or increasing the total number of dual enrollment classes offered. We talked about internships and externships. The, the problem here is, is that the more we require, the less freedom these students have to choose. The more we require the more likelihood of something stacking up on a child. If you offer that fourth year of math, which is very, very, in, you know, seems logical because I'm going to prepare you for what's next. And math is definitely part of your future. However, if you don't pass math at the beginning, now you have a, a year where you have two math classes just to meet the requirements on time or three math classes just to meet the requirements on time. And as we said, if that's not your interest, that's doing nothing but punish you and you should be using that time to be prepared a different way. So we did not add any of those. We want to make sure that this is more flexible and personal for our students. We believe we've done that. However, I do want direction from the board moving forward because this is something we can change as we move forward if we want to add something um, to our graduation requirements. Yes, sir. Well, not so much add something to the requirements, but something from an administrative level. And I know we've talked, Mike, you and I have talked about this. The idea that if, if I were to choose a hard bioscience career field. The classes I would take would be different than somebody who was choosing to be a lawyer or an engineer. And, and so is there going to be any kind of a, 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 yes, sir. a program so that if I walk in and say, hey, I think I'd like to be a forester, an engineer, a lawyer, whatever, Right. And they would hand me this list of courses and say, here, these are the ones you, you should consider taking. Yes, sir. We are working currently on our academies program, which is in line with these pathways. We're looking at things like arts and communication. We're looking at things like health and human services, business and supply chain management. Um, you know, all of these different areas that will do just that. We'll kind of map out those courses for those students so that parents and students can sit down and make an intelligent choice about what electives they're going to take, which dual enrollment opportunities might be available, et cetera, all aligned to that, um, to those pathways. I'm glad to hear that because as you well know, one of my pet peeves is that if I'm going to take a hard science career field, I don't necessarily need a literature class in the 12th grade in my English. I need something that's more technical, technical writing. writing. Yes, or, sir. Or, or, or how you write one of those logical type, type themes because that's what I'm going to be asked to do when I get to that career. On the other hand, if I'm an English major, yes, I probably need that literature. Yes, sir. Mr. Schroes, um, I can tell you Mr. Vukovic uh, has provided the charge, the responsibility, the resources, the background, and the opportunities. We are developing those pathways. 
Mr. Heinrich named a few of those. Um, I said, Mr. Vukovic has charged us with coming together and developing those pathways, but not only those pathways, but for instance, those specific career uh, fields or areas uh, that we can indeed, similar to when you and I went to college and said, okay, here's what you need to take. This is what you need to do. We also, we also feel very confident that the electives we offer to our school, the internship experience, the college and high school efforts that we are doing. Um, Mr. Vukovic, Mr. Heinrich recently, uh, we just had a meeting with IUP and they are on board with um, developing these pathways. We want to know what are all the courses that IEP has, has and what are all the courses WCC has and the Mount Aloysia, and then we can start filling in those things. And then furthermore, what we want to do is have an industry or business partner endorse that pathway or that career um, that career journey, so to speak. What are, what are all the things I need to do and check off so that I'm in the best possible place when I leave high school for that? Thank you. And I do want to just bring your attention real quickly to that, that document I shared with you a few weeks ago that has all of that culminating project laid out. Um, I'm trying to share it with you on the screen here, but I'm having a hard time bringing it up. But if you want to look at that, across the bottom are all the tabs that, um, let's see if it, that works. Yeah, it won't come up for some reason. But anyway, across the bottom are all the tabs of all the, e, of all the different areas that we've identified to be um, Indiana ready. And that includes um, you know, things like community service and reliability, responsibility, et cetera. And you can click on those tabs and see all of the things that we've identified as showing proficiency in each of those areas. And, you know, so I'd encourage you to look at that because that is what we're trying to have you approve next Monday is that culminating project along with those pathways to graduation and those a couple, a few uh, stipulations um, about dual enrollment, et cetera. I can resend it to you, absolutely. Uh, the title of the doc, yes, I can resend it to you. I'll just, I'll resend it to you right after this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, we do need to get this done relatively quickly because we need to right now, if those students are going to have to take that AP exam, they need to be ordering that AP exam. If they are going to count that dual enrollment class at IUP, that needs to count now because they're enrolled in that class. Or if not enrolled in that class, they need to enroll in that class now because the ad drop period is quite, is very quickly going past. So we need we need you to at least approve those things sooner rather than later so that this opportunity is available. And then those other things, if you want to amend them, change them, whatever, we can do that in future years. If you don't take the AP, AP test, do you still get the five points? Yes, you do, because right now a graduating senior – we won't get that AP result back till they're long gone. So you get the five points regardless as it is now. So that's no change. Yes, sir, we did. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, we're running out of time, uh, but we have several things left. Yeah, let, I'll take back over and we'll go through this quite uh, quickly. Um, <laughs> no, he was very well done. Mine's not as elaborate. He, he, yeah, his, his was much more uh, intense and, than mine. And, and to be fair, We've been working on this for a long time. Mm -hmm. The administration, the Absolutely. faculty, the staff. This is this is something that we. This is the culmination of a lot of work. So it's the meaningful work. Right? I'm really glad you took the time to go yep. over. Thank Absolutely, uh, Mr. Harley. Next on the list, I am asking for permission from this committee. Uh, I know we have about five board members on, between in person and hybrid. I'm asking for committee uh, permission from this committee to authorize me to enter into uh, agreement with Department of Health to offer COVID testing here on school premises. There's no cost to the district. This is um, paid for by Department of Health through a subcontractor, and they're gonna provide us testing, that, which would be administered by our health staff. So when I say there's no cost, there's no cost for the test themselves. Our staff would have to be administering these exams, but I still think it's a, it's a worthwhile endeavor. We would be looking at the rapid antigen testing. And one thing that we have to work on our communication, sir, is consent prior um, is consent is required prior to the testing because there's some misinformation out there, but we're going to test kids at random, test pool test kids. 
we're not going to do that at all, sir. But I think this is a good way to keep kids in school, mitigate the spread, and allow those kids who can't come back off quarantine the ability to come back at knowing that we have some safeguards in place. It is voluntary basis only. There will be no mass pull testing. I keep using that term because when this started, sir, there's two options. You could do pull testing, so a whole group of people, or the individual testing. After some great conversations with the nurses, we think it's in our best interest to do individual testing at this time. But again, voluntary. Again, voluntary, individual testing based on those kids or teachers or staff members who may be symptomatic. I included some the assurances for the board to look at prior to Monday. Um, I look at the consent form that you can look at some consent information that's going to be sent when kids and, and families do consider put this out. And I also include some privacy information. Uh, as this is a third party vendor, not necessary us, there's some assurances, some clarity around privacy, as I think that's important. Um, another reason why I want to do this besides mitigating the spread, keeping kids in school if we can, is the issue, it's my understanding, that tests are hard to come by now. I used to go to CVS or Walmart and buy them. These tests are getting harder and harder to come by. Uh, so this is another way to keep kids in school or at least get them back off quarantine. How, how, is this, that's what I was going to ask you. How does this impact quarantine? testing what it does sir is it can help us get the process if quarantine you can get quarantined a couple come back a couple days sooner you can't test until after the fifth day and you can't come back till the eighth day but it still will shave off two to three days of a child's quarantine through this testing so this is a step in the right direction so, so as a parent even though i may not like the idea of testing if it helps get my student or my child back in the school Mm -hmm. I may opt for it for that reason to get them back in school soon. Sure. And and understand this. There's also some community outlets too. Uh, right now, I, I reason I was late to my meeting, I was with IRMC. They are now doing weekend testing. So that's an option for families. But what we wanted to do, this board has valued eliminating barriers. Transportation may be a barrier for some. So we thought if we do it in-house, it's one thing that we could do to help um, keep our community and our kids safe. And again, though, to re-echo your point, Mr. Harley, it's voluntary. And I have to work on a parent communication to send that out once the board either makes a decision either way, but we'll make sure we spell that out, sir. Um, this antigen test, this is the more reliable test, is it not? You know, I, I have our school nurses on the call. They can speak to that. I believe it's the more reliable. This is the quicker, faster one. Yeah. My understanding, CDC is looking at the PCR testing and think some changes may come there. I, I don't want to misspeak. I think it's reliable, I, but I also would urge some caution that there could be false sure. positive on both exams, but I do think it is the more of the sir of no, the two, sir. I believe that's true. Okay. Uh, but again, it makes sense. It's voluntary and it'd be for those kids who are symptomatic. However, other people may want to take use of it and we'll do that. But our primary focus would be looking at individual testing for symptomatic individuals. Very good. Okay. Bring it to the board. Here's the next thing I need with that, sir. Um, there's five of you here. Can I get approval this evening and then retroactively approve it? The only reason why is I need a lot. I need three weeks to get this up and running if we're going to start by November 1st. If you say no, I can always delay it two weeks. I don't want to press you. Um, at this point, I'm hoping that by it's voluntary, you're comfortable with it. Well, not only voluntary, but there's no cost to it. Yep. So so the board would have to act as there was a cost, but there's no cost. So I think, I think, is that okay? Good. I don't, I, I've lost my computer with it. Okay. Is Tammy still there? Okay. Tammy says go for it. I can't see. Is that what she did? Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. you're comfortable with that? I'll I'll reach out to them tomorrow then. Yeah. Uh, next thing moving on, uh, musical and play fees. I think we have a wonderful arts program. As you know, the board authorized us to bring in uh, Professor Jones from IUP to come in and, and look at the program even in greater detail. Uh, I'm asking and recommending that we pay the royalties and licensing fees for this year due to COVID-related issues. Um, they did, as you know, weren't able to generate revenue. I would like us to look at um, – taking a one-time hit of expenditures between ten dollars to $15,000 for us to provide the broadly fees for junior and senior high um, and get them back on their feet. I think it's only fair. I think it's reasonable. I would say for do it for one year. If you want to continue that discussion, that's fine. I don't want to box you in. But right now, I included a five-year cost history, and you can see how their revenues decreased from the previous year with COVID. And if we're going to want the higher arts program and see the art program thriving, then this allows us to put a little bit of money into it, investing and give them a leg up in a time where I, just, I think they Mike, need it. Mike, Mike, uh, I have absolutely no problem doing this with one provision. They guarantee that the play, the musical, the whatever will go off. No excuses. And I can have that conversation this week with Wade. <laughs> okay, and okay. We can make sure no, 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 okay. It, it goes off. It, okay. Uh, I, I don't want to hear... Like no, 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 no. Last, last year, the junior high musical was stopped 
the weekend that it was supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Okay. But, but, so, but, so, so they're going to make the effort at it, but they can't. They can't guarantee that we're not going to get shut down. If we can't control it, we will control but, it. But, right. but, but, but this, but this past school year, we should have done a better job of getting making that happen. Correct. Okay, and we didn't, and that's that's my that's my issue. Yeah, I, and I learned a lesson on that. I'll make sure I, I mean Wade take better control of that and make sure it happens. And if we can't control it, sir, you have my word, we will. Yeah. Um, but I think this is a step in the right direction and, to help get them on their feet again. And echoing Walter's point, though, this is this is the this is the seed money that they lost from the COVID shutdown. And, and, and both okay music, both musicals got taken out by the knees. All the expenses were out the door, and none of the income showed up. Agreed. What's this chart? Is this senior high stuff only? Uh, I'll defer to Mr. McElhaney. Uh, that's the spreadsheet you provided me, Mr. McElhaney. Um, what happened, Mr. I'll let Wade explain it. I asked what were the total costs because I don't know how they change in value. So I asked for some details or some facts surrounding what the expected cost would be. Yes, it's senior high only. So the junior high would, would be a comparable. Well, last year, Cinderella was $5,700. Yeah, Yes, ma'am. That's the information I was presented with. Yes, ma'am. These costs may be a little bit lower, but the, the royalty costs are the same. Yeah. Yeah. So the junior high did have their musical last year. No, they were prepared for it, but got shut. We had, I pulled the plug on okay. it. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. And the musical that the junior high did do was a remote. <clears throat> I think the costs are comparable. I asked for their best guests because at this time we didn't have, at the time I was asked for us, we didn't have a director in place. So those are the, the information I was provided. Yes, if, if you can get any more accurate numbers for the motion, that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. And it's for one year, yes? Yeah, that would be my recommendation. You can always revisit it, but I think it's a fair shake to get them off, off the ground and running again. And has any, any um, attention been paid or thought about um, the Cinderella that was not used at all, the play did not go on, did, did nothing. Is there any kind of an agreement that we could be making with the copyright people, the royalties people, whatever, to give us a reduced price to have that same play again since we did not use it? Yeah, that's a, our fault? I mean, that's a great idea to look into. I can't tell you I did it, but I can definitely look into it. Wait. Oh, yeah, you had a whole year, a whole class of kids graduate, so your your yeah, just theater really core know. might be. We can look into it. But if, you know, if you could get if you could get Cinderella for you know three thousand five hundred instead of four thousand five hundred, it might be. I, I think it's worth an ask, Miss Cinderella. We could definitely do that. I'll I'll talk to Jared tomorrow. We can definitely look into. It. Okay. Uh, while we're on the music, um, I do want to turn the floor over to Dr. Minnick and uh, Dr. Rumble here. I think they're here to speak to you uh, about a music um, in residency uh, you have here happening at the middle school. We just want to make the board aware because we know we set, recognize, even some people may not think so, we recognize and value the arts and we want to very inform what we're doing here. And I want to give the floor to these two gentlemen to explain what's happening at the middle school real quick. Thank you. I have a request. We have a We had a request to have a, a guest artist come to the junior high and Dr. Rummel is here uh, to just describe what he had in mind and he wanted to share that. And I appreciate the opportunity. I know it's been a long night. I appreciate uh, giving us a chance to jump in. So uh, Dr. Rummel. I promise not to take too much of your time. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of informing you of something exciting that's happening and I don't have to ask you for anything. So <laughs> it's all good. It's all good news. <laughs> So just a very brief history. You guys know that for decades now, we've had the jazz artist in residence uh, over 20 years of bringing in someone in the spring to work specifically with the jazz program from elementary through high school. Um, we had that ready to go two years ago. Uh, we were bringing an artist in from Arizona. We had everything booked. COVID, of course, shut everything down. And we were able to recoup a lot of that costs. Uh, but some things like flight credits, you know, just became credits instead of refunds. Um, that started getting us thinking, how can we use some of those funds to maybe think outside the box? All right, set that idea aside. This past spring, when we were all creatively coming up with ways to engage our students when we had some of them in schools and some of them at home, um, 
at the junior high with the sixth grade chorus, we did a piece of music called Top of the Stairs by Nashville singer, songwriter, Grammy nominated artist, uh, Scott Mulvihill. And uh, when we had the piece performance ready, we reached out to Mr. Mulvihill and he did a Zoom meeting with us. We were able to perform for him. Uh, he was very engaging with the students, uh, very inspiring. And so we started bringing these two ideas together and thought maybe we can do some sort of artist in residence that's that's a more uh, broad approach than just going with the jazz artist. So long story short, Mr. Mulvihill, Scott Mulvihill has uh, agreed to come to Indiana School District. He is, he is booked to be here from November 16th through 18th. Um, we're still figuring out exactly what those three days are going to look like, but we've reached out to uh, well outside the music department to see how we can involve other curricular areas. So um, I know that Kelly Stubbe with the Life Skills Kids at the junior high is very eager to engage with Mr. Malva Hill on some of the themes in, in some of his songs, uh, particularly a tune called Joy. She's got some big ideas with things that she can do with his, uh, her kids. Um, we've got some ELA teachers who are uh, thinking about poetry writing and how that, uh, you know, where the crossovers are between poetry and songwriting and lyric writing. Mr. Malva Hill's excited to be involved in that. Plus, of course, he'll be involved in various um, musical ensembles. We, the junior high vocal ensemble starting to work on a tune this Wednesday that we're hoping to perform with him. Uh, Mr. O'Lear and Ms. Laird and I, uh, Dr. Laird and I have a meeting tomorrow to figure out how he's going to be engaged with, with the ensembles at the high school. So there's, this is kind of early in the process, but we just wanted to let you know it's happening. He's going to be here for three days. Um, he, he's a very dynamic musician. I, I had Mr. O'Neill have a video ready for you, but we can forego that because I know we got a, a million things still on your agenda. Um, could, but you, could you make that... Um, video available for us to look at at our leisure absolutely well i'll send some links out just so you can see who he is he's he's a he's a bass player a upright bass player and uh he's just extremely engaging i uh, we my family got to know him a couple of years ago when he was performing with another artist and we were just blown away at his ability and and it's really a, a delight that he's coming here we, we can't believe it so um we're also working out we're in the process of working out a community performance he's going to be he's going to be playing somewhere in indiana during those three days but like a lot of artists you got to work these things out with their management so we're still figuring that out but um yeah i wish i had more like concrete things like this is definitely happening but he's going to be here for three very busy days and uh should be good that sounds great. Yeah, we're, we're very, very excited. So, all right. Thanks okay. very much. Uh, last thing we have, Mr. Harley, it is with great pleasure to um, let Ms. Mc, Dr. McMasters present to us on the Summer Academy program. Her, Rob, and the entire team did an amazing job. And when you look at what the work they did over the summer, it was quite amazing. I'm quite proud of the work. Um, so they'll talk about the academic gains financially. We came under budget. Um, I know I was a worrier about that. Uh, we came about $25,000 under budget. So we're quite proud of that as well. But with that said, I do would like Ange to just talk about the great work they did. Because at the end of the day, I don't know if you remember, a month ago I told you state law was changing more of the alignment of what we're doing. And now you're starting to really see some this tree bear some fruit in the middle of a pandemic. we got a lot more work to do, but there's been some great strides. And the question I would say phatically, did the summer camp program work? And I would say yes. It did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have two things in front of you. Uh, Mr. Hunter is going to share the presentation. I will quickly explain the summer camp Acadians reading. Um, so I was trying to figure out the best way to summarize this data because there was so much. And I felt like we almost had three different categories of students. We had students who only attended session one. We had students who only attended session two, and then we had students who attended both sessions. So we broke the data out into those three different categories. So when you see N equals 10, that means that that's the number of students that only attended that particular session. Um, and then what you see that's shaded, I felt like it was important to look at, are we catching up those students who fall within the below and well below benchmark categories, the yellow and the red? And so when I highlighted or shaded those areas, 
those were the ones that had the greatest impact for some of our students falling in those categories. Not to say that our above and our at benchmark students didn't grow. They did, but I felt like with COVID and all the things, it was really important to see was our impact substantial for those most intensive needs. Um, so what you'll see overall is that um, K to two had the greatest amount of impact. And when you look at this up, this is one of my favorite slides. I feel bag right there. It kind of put things in perspective. Um, so for students in third grade, their last normal year was kindergarten. So for when you're looking at this information and the amount of impact that you can have on students, I felt like this was really remarkable. We were able to basically create a school from the ground up. So you had teachers that didn't know each other. The MTSS team, we had our administrators, obviously, but the MTSS team, we were figuring things out that I don't think we've ever figured out before. So I felt like we got to grow as a team. I felt like across the district, just everybody coming together um, for the better of our students. It was a really great experience. A little stressful some days, but the kids, I think, loved it. I've, I've been in different places. They're like, we remember you from summer camp. So that's been cool for me too. Um, all of our groupings for summer catch-up camp were based on, could you go back one more time? I'm sorry. I'm going to try to be real quick. Um, targeted instruction in reading and math. So we really focused on literacy because that's been our initiative. Um, but we based all of the instruction on targeted skill groups. And so we wanted to make sure that we were further preventing any slide from COVID, but also making sure that we could catch students up that maybe have fallen behind. Because the other part of this is quarantines definitely have an impact because they're missing out on that in-person instruction. There's disruptions to the instruction. Our ideal teachers have done an amazing job trying to keep as much continuity with that as possible. Um, and lastly, we really focused on evidence-based instructional practices and coaching. And that was actually a lot of fun for our team because we got to spend more time. I think me, even Miss Urbani got to spend some time coaching. Uh, so that was great for us to be able to see the impact that that can have even in such a short amount of time. So if you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to share the attendance. So if you look, there's pretty well attended and we did have some students who did not attend often um, and, but I, the averages still came in, at, in about 80 to 85%. We had some students who came a week, were on vacation for a week and came back and they still kind of entered in pretty seamlessly. So that was the average attendance. And we had a lot of people wanting ads too. So we were, we were in high demand for summer Academy, which is cool. Um, so looking at the impact of summer camp, this was slightly challenging because if you think about students who attended session one, they only attended for 11 instructional days because they had the fun day at the pool. Um, you look at students who attended both, they had 22 days of instruction. A cadence reading was used as our tool because it's sensitive to small increments of change. But we also wanted to see how did that trajectory lead to beginning of the year? So if your students ended at a certain place, did they maintain? Did they grow? And what does that look like? And it was very interesting because the progress monitoring data really aligned with where their beginning of the scores fell, beginning of the year benchmark scores fell. Um, so I would like to see us continue to examine the impact in the long term, but I felt like it was almost like launching those kids forward into their next year. So I feel like kids who went from the end of the school year into session one, maintained or grew. Um, and then students who attended second into the start of the year kind of had a jump start. And students who attended both sessions seem to have the greatest impact, which makes the most sense, right? So um, if you want to go to the next slide, I was trying to figure out where's the greatest impact. And primary grades K to two had the greatest overall impact, regardless of when the sessions were attended. So um, we know that when they're in kindergarten to second grade, that it's a bit easier to make headway and to catch up ground that's been lost. Um, in third to fifth grade, there were greater impacts on students who attended session one or both sessions one and two. Those students didn't have as much of a gain if they only attended session two by itself. 
Um, we also know that after grade three, it is most difficult to close those gaps that exist. And our tool, unless we survey leveled back every student, is not going to be as sensitive to change. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is that even if students didn't change categories from below benchmark to at benchmark, that a lot of students still made growth. So that was a really positive thing to see as well. Um, some, Do Dr. Yeah, Masters, sorry. would you say the growth that we saw in K-2, that's exactly where we wanted to see the return on investment, yeah. to springboard them ready for grade three and beyond? I, I mean, those are the kids who most likely have seen two years of pandemic, mm -hmm. missed a, a tremendous amount of structure, and now are going into a tested year, in this case, the PSSA. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree. And I also think, too, building those foundational skills for that ability to be able to transition to the reading to learn is very important. And I was not that I should have been surprised by the results, but as we were doing this, all three of us were like, oh, my gosh, look at this. Oh, my goodness, look at that. Yeah, and, and Ann shows herself and her team a little bit short. The MTSS team, Mrs. Urbani, Mr. Springer, they sat down and they planned this out and they they directed a lot of the resources toward that K to two range. Because, if, I mean, imagine if you're building a house, you start with the foundation. You don't start with the roof, right? And that's where the biggest need was. And they really made sure that those groups were the smallest. They had the most attention and uh, because they knew that was where the biggest need was. So that was very deliberate on our part, too. And I would also add that the teachers delivering the instruction, um, some of them are ours and we knew them and some of them weren't ours and we didn't know them. And they were very open to the coaching, very open to learning the strategies and all the things. And some of the ones that weren't ours became ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, definitely. Um, can you go back one more time? Sorry, I thought that there was one more thing. Oh, just a couple of variables that we should consider. Um, Student attendance was hit or miss sometimes. Some classrooms would only end up with 50%. So in session two, we did have some difficulties with staffing due to teacher attendance, which the teachers were wonderful attending when they could. Things come up and we can't control for those. And what I would like to say is that some of our teachers, when we were like, hey, we're, we really are in a pinch, um, Angie Petroff and her third grade team rallied and, and they joined us for a day to help fill in. So... I know that that was something that was difficult at, from time to time. Um, so that could have some impact depending on the grade levels. Like we did have to condense some classes and things like that just due to some unforeseen circumstances that occurred. Um, but all in all, I felt like we were, we were very adaptable to whatever curveballs came our way. Um, I felt like Leah and Jack did such, and Lori Dadson did such a great job just kind of running everything kind of ran like a well-oiled machine and I don't know, it was, it was tiring in the moment, but so worth it. I think it was. And I, and I don't want to take time giving accolades, but they're deserved. I mean, you know, from the elementary people, uh, you know, Mrs. Eisenman, Ms. Savage and helped out the junior high helped out with uh, the facilities and all of the, you know, the teamwork that was involved there. I mean, it really was a, a collaborative effort from the bottom up. And we're very, very pleased with the results. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot, too. We learned where we can be better next year as well. Um, but it, it really was. I mean, people do deserve that pat on the back because it was a tremendous amount of work uh, to basically launch another school year. Oh, yeah. The why. Yes. Oh, my goodness. And some of the volunteers were our own high school students who didn't even get paid. Yeah. So that was also incredible. And I just so, want to add one thing. Mr. Edmondson also helped out a lot. I think he went back to his elementary days a little bit. I think he did. <laughs> so, 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 Ange, the whole purpose of this summer school program was to help catch the students up because of the impact that COVID and the disruption that COVID caused in their, in their education. Did it do it 100%? And there's a reason for my question. And that is... Should the board be looking, if it didn't, then does the board need to start to think about doing another summer camp next year to, to continue that to get them caught up to whatever level they need to be? I think we need to do a summer camp every year with or without COVID. It's invaluable, totally so, invaluable. I don't agree with Cinda very often, but this one. <laughs> <laughs> It, would, it, it I, makes sense that, that, that we learn from this ex experiment, okay? And if we can slingshot our kids through summer, and you had 400 and some kids, 
Yeah, nearly 500. Yep. Holy smokes, that's 20% of our population. And, and to Ms. Inda's point, we're going to have to. The, you're not going to close a gap in one summer. You're not. I mean, as 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 you continue to pile on the quarantines, as you continue to face these other obstacles, we're, if you want to, there's a great need for it. It would not be money right. uh, wasted. It would be well spent. I, I, my, my, my question is somewhat rhetorical because I didn't really believe that you could do it in one. Not that you didn't try. And then not for lack of effort or or technique or whatever, but um, the, the question is, and I think the board needs to start to look at and you figure out how to fund uh, another three hundred or two hundred and seventy five thousand for next we're, year. We're good for next summer. I already took money out of Esther's. The board approved that, so you already budgeted for next year. You're good. the The issue would be what happens when the Esther's funds dries up and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But right now we're okay. good for next summer. Um, the only other person I'll thank since we're thanking it, IEP did a great job too coming in. Everyone worked together. Like, you know, you could tell someone's character when tragedy hits and how you respond. And this was kind of the bend don't, but don't break defense. Um, and, and we got through it. What did IEP do? Uh, Casey, Dr. Casey Calburn and her team came in, provided speech burst sessions and it provided additional support for kids. So, we all worked well together. It was a true collaborative effort, and and so they deserve all the credit. And all the maintenance people, and all the yep. cafeteria workers, yep. and all the bus drivers, and the secretaries. Everyone. It was a complete district. Yeah. Yeah, we, it was really interesting because you know usually you're going into a school year, and teachers have time to decorate their rooms, and they got all prepped, and they did have some prep time. But talk about like walking in, like here you go, here's your kids, and they only had 11 days of instruction, and so. They really capitalized on that, um, despite some of the hurdles that we experienced. Yeah. Even this in 22 days. Yeah. And some for some of those kids, it wasn't even and that whole amount of time. And that's something that I think, um, and this is something I'd like to share with you in the future. Like you think about a fishbowl, you don't look at a fish tank and wait for a fish to start to turn belly up. You keep your water healthy so that if your fish starts to swim sideways, you're like, what's going on with that fish? So I kind of feel like we have to look at those general practices across the board and just continue to realize that. This is like high intensity workout all the time. And not that we don't let kids have fun and enjoy their learning. Cause I still see plenty of smiles in the classrooms and in the hallways and all the things. But I think we, as the adults just step back and look at, you know, how do we make sure that this doesn't have more of an impact than it already has? So. Very good. Great. Well, you guys did do a great job and, and, Dr. McMaster's, April Morelli, Shelley Wright spent countless hours, you know, both on the clock and off the clock, <laughs> preparing this, managing it, looking at the data, breaking it down. I mean, the I can't say enough about the work they did. They really, really drove this. They were the engine, the wheels, the axles, everything that drove this. So kudos to you and your team. Fantastic work. I apologize for three-hour meeting, but... Boy, it went pretty quick, um, and and the discussion, Rob, that you had, was just great, great. So, Angie, thank you for yeah. for leading that charge, and uh, gosh, yeah. All right, sir. Yeah. Good makes night, me, everyone. Makes me want to come back next week. It was good. <laughs> okay, let's close it down. This is the stuff you don't mind because it's the work. Yeah. Like this is the good stuff. Yeah. This kind of feels like the fruits of our labor. Like this was like all so that like work is a moment. Though, that's like, what I hate. Hey, I'll do this quick five minute warm up for the meeting. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs>